guys, and welcome to another episode of This Feral Life. We're very happy to have you, and we're going to kind of apologize for a second that we haven't uh, been around for the last couple of weeks. Everything's been crazy with the house stuff, uh, which is great. They cleared a bunch of land. Um, what else they do? They put down a foundation. Yep. Um, the light and the electricity and water is supposedly supposed to be going in here really quick. And I believe the house actually, like, the majority of the house stuff gets delivered and put together tomorrow. Yeah. Theoretically. Yes, theoretically. Yeah. I want to get my hopes up. Yeah, it's going to be, like, super hot. Yeah. So, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. When, when's our last hottest day? Thursday. Thursday. Yay, supposedly. Supposedly. Supposedly Thursday's going to be, like, 107. And then from there, it's supposed to start cooling down. And it won't be absolutely, hatefully, uh, horrible in the near future. Which yeah. can be kind of cool. So uh, today's episode is going to be about um, monetizing the animals on your farm. Our last episode was about monetizing your farm and how you can make money on your farm. So this is going to be specifically about animals. And uh, let's go ahead and just jump right in. All right. So let's start with like, let's just uh, do biggest to smallest. Is that biggest to smallest. Yeah, biggest that smallest. works. All right. So uh, biggest to smallest animals. Let's talk about cows. Uh, cows is a losing prospect. <laughs> yeah, I read it's not really lucrative for like a homestead, like a small yeah. homestead. But I mean, if you're on a commercial level, obviously that's a game changer. That's different. Yeah, but they need like but, yeah, they need like hundreds of cattle yeah, to make make a profit. A standard a standard cattle like stuff. If you're gonna do it like just a regular feed operation, you need hundreds of cattle to be able to to make any money because it's basically making money on margins. Like you're making five, ten, fifteen percent. Right, so it's it's not making money on anything. Um, and by the time you get done paying for like the vet care and the people and the processing of the animal and everything else, you know, you're breaking even at best. Okay, what about having like a local butchery? So okay, that's where selling portions of your cow is how people can make money. So like, let's say you raise up a big old beef, you take a bunch of pictures of it, you name it, I don't know, ribeye. And you put ribeye on social media and you're like, hey, this side back here is real juicy. You guys want uh, to buy part of ribeye? And then you sell it at a premium because they've been watching ribeye grow up the whole time. They know exactly they know what, what ribeye eats. Yeah, they know exactly what's in ribeye. If they want to come Grass visit bed. ribeye, they could have yeah. visited ribeye at your farm. So it's like you can't get any more farm to table than that. And then that goes at a premium. And you can you can make money at that. Not, I mean, you're not going to make enough money to buy a new car. Right, but you'll make enough money to buy from one cow to buy two cows. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, so, uh, or, or to pay for your half of your cow that you keep for your family, um, as well as all the butchery costs and feed costs and everything. Where it gets really interesting is if you're doing, um, if you have the exception to, let's say, in certain freedom-loving freedom states, it's not going to work in some of the more communistic states. But in certain freedom-loving states, you can sell them the the meat, and then uh, they participate in the butchery. Okay. Right. So it's kind of like a loophole, Interesting. where you can like basically rent them your machinery to butcher okay, their animal, yeah. kind but of then like provide would, like, service like a teaching a class. I mean, yeah, that's kind of cool. I yeah. I've seen that you know like the. The commercial kitchens that you go and lease for a couple of hours and use all their equipment and all that. It's kind of like Something that. Something like that, right? But like for that murder. Same model, but yeah. 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 Butchering. Okay. For murder. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and you show them at the same time, like, how to make the cuts and all that. Yeah. And, okay. and that kind of, in that kind of situation, they have to be present. They have to participate. But it's kind of a loophole way to get around having to actually pay for a big butcher. That's if you're comfortable in doing your own butchery. And if you're comfortable in doing your own butchery, that way you can make pretty good money off of it. Then. Yeah. Because uh, butchering is expensive. It's very expensive. So if you're going to do cattle, that's one way to do it. Um, selling cow, little like baby cows, works out pretty decent. Yeah. Well, let's, let's just talk about like homestead in general, like that level. So yeah. even filling your own family's freezer or if you have your own little community and you guys all go in on purchasing a small calf and raising it, feeding it. Um, you know, everybody knows is, is on board with what the cow's eating. Um, and then you harvest, you process it, you harvest and process it. And then, um, you know, you fill your freezers for the year. Like that's advantageous too. So having access to that type of meat uh, with no hormones, it's 
just really grade A beef. Um, it, it's really a game changer. There really is a difference. We've done that a couple of times for our families. Yeah. Families and extended family. Um, and it was actually quite nice. You know, the, well, that's because we do our own butchery. Yeah, and it tastes entirely different. Oh, like the ground better. beef. Way oh my better. god, it's just amazing. Way you better. know, very clean and doesn't get better than that. Uh, I would suggest that you stick with some of the more smaller cattle breeds. Yeah. Like Dexter. Or uh, if you wanted to do um, the smart way to do this, and I'm going to tell you, is to get yourself a boy Dexter cow, right? And get yourself a female, uh, like one of those mini Swiss. Is that what they are? No, the, the Highlander or the mini Jersey. The mini Jersey. I yeah. love a Jersey. I want a mini Jersey so bad. Yeah, so get yourself a mini Jersey and a, you, you, you can use a Highlander. Yeah. Or if you want a pet, but I mean, it's really hot. Or you can get like a uh, mini Dexter, like a Dexter, and breed those guys, sell the babies, or eat or raise the baby for meat, because both of those will be fine for meat, and sell the milk products. Now, I'm saying, why would you go with a, uh, like a, a mini Jersey? Because that guy is still putting out, you know, four to five gallons of milk a day. It's just not putting out 10 to 15, like a full size one. What the heck are you going to do with 15 gallons of milk a day? Yeah. It's ridiculous. So, uh, wait. So, how, how cheese and milk works is that you're going to get, uh, you know, four ounces or three to four ounces of heavy cream per gallon. And that's going to turn into your, your, your um, butter, right? Then you're going to get a pound of cheese per gallon. And then you'll get about six ounces of ricotta per gallon. So, if you do the math really quick, what the heck are you going to do with, like, 15 freaking pounds of, like, cheese a day? All right? So, unless you're in a full-blown operation, going with a, uh, a mini is going to be the way to go. Yeah. Uh, for your, just, like, your your home operation. Butter, if you, yeah, cheese product. It'll make more. Yeah. It'll make so much. You'll have plenty to just sell. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, if you're doing a farmer's market once a week. Yeah. You know, and you've got your mini, mini jersey, and she's rocking and rolling. Now, let's say she's putting an average out of, like, just let's low end it. Three, 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 uh, you know, three gallons a day. You have 21 pounds of cheese, right? You have uh, seven or eight pounds of ricotta. Um, and, you know. No, the whey, three right? or, Yeah, from the whey. And the whey. Well, that, you, get the, you get the ricotta from the whey. Yeah. Uh, and then you have, like, you know, uh, three or four pounds of butter every week to sell. And, uh. You're going to sell it at a premium. It's not you're not trying to compete with H E B or any grocery stores. Yeah, your stuff is a premium product. It's going to be a premium product because you made it. It came from your animals. It was made by your hand. It wasn't made by a machine somewhere. And people will complain at the food at, at the the uh, farmers markets, but you just nod your head and go, "Okay, don't argue with them. Don't try to justify how much you're charging for stuff. Just go, okay, and." You know, that's it. I don't argue with them. If they want to, well, I could go get, you know, ricotta at, at HEB and it's X, Y, and Z dollars. You know, it's like, you know, and I'm like, okay. Uh, even though my, I know mine's better, I'm not going to argue that mine's better uh, because you're not going to willing to give it to them for free so they can see that yours better, right? Because that's what they want. They want to win. And, yeah. And, but a winning, winning, they get, they get it for free or you cut them a deal so they can try it, hoping they come back and then they're, they're not going to. If they're already arguing with you over the price of, like, a pound of cheese, they don't know the value of the product and they don't care about it. Yeah. So, it doesn't matter. You can't win over everybody and you're not going to... Your customers are not the people that are going to nitpick over everything. Your customer base are the people who want quality. They want to know where the food comes from. They want to meet the artisanal yeah. person behind the food. And they want to support the local source of where their artisanal items come from. Yes, you know it's not it's not random Joe Blow you know walking down the street eating microwave burritos from Seven Eleven and thinking that's that's the good stuff, right? It, you're looking for people with with, with a little bit of culture and taste, uh, and those are going to be your that's going to be your, your primary customers. And there's plenty there's there's plenty of them out there. Yeah. So you're not you're not missing out on a, if you miss out on a sale. Oh well, it's cheese. Let me tell you what happens with cheese I, I, over time. It gets better. Some of them do expire. Yeah. If you make really soft cheeses. Yeah. But like your feta cheese, if you yeah. make feta cheese and you drop it in oil, 
Like the old timey, like how the Greeks Do you know, and stuff. Yeah, feta lasts, cheese was the first cheese, actually. Yeah, it lasts forever. I'm like, how can it be such like? It must have been amazing, like Mediterranean food, like feta cheese. Like. I don't believe the first cheeses were amazing, sweetie. As far as I'd I like know, to think that they are. As far as I know, the history of cheese involved using um, bladders, right? They were that's what they made the water thing jug. Right. Out. So what it was is it was along the Silk Road. And this is as far as I understand the history of cheese. As it was along the Silk Road, they had water bladders full of um, milk. Right, and as it was sitting there and sloshing back and forth on the back of the camel, oh, that's nice. <laughs> right inside there, sounds tasty. And it got hot. Yeah, it uh, curdled and soured. And then when they went to go drink their stuff, it turned into those like cottage cheese, basically. Right. Yeah. So I'm thinking it's probably not like grade A, <laughs> right? <laughs> bladder cheese, grade A bladder cheese, bladder um, cheese. Butter cheese does whatever cheese does. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. okay, so let's talk about storing uh, your cheese. Like, if you did make that or produce that, that okay. Cheese, so let's say like, you made a farmhouse cheddar. You're selling it by the wedge, um, and who's saying you have to cut it up beforehand? Why can't you cut it up there? No, yeah. One. So if you have a whole, if you have a whole circle, like your little, let's say you, you made a PVC cheese press, right? And you can press like a two pound block of cheese at a time. Like little cheese yeah. press. PVC cheese press, super easy to make. Um, look it up, guys. I mean, they're, they're so easy to make. Uh, I've accidentally made something similar when I was, you know, playing with cheese. I just used books to press it. So it was really, really, cheese presses are super easy to make. So you have a little two pound block of cheese. Who's saying you have to cut it up into serving sizes already? If you just keep your two pound block of cheese, if somebody wants some, carve off a little sample or something off of it. But at the end, you take it home that block of cheese. You can wax dip it. Yeah. And then and now just you wax can wax that cut. Back. No, just wax the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It takes like thirty. So I I have remember that big red um, crock pot. Crock pot that's yeah. full of wax. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the heck is this? That big red crock pot full of wax is is the cheese wax. It's the yeah. cheese wax crock pot. It's just uh, it's uncleanable. So if you're gonna get a cheese, if you're gonna make a cheese wax crock pot, uh, be prepared to sacrifice that crock pot. Wait until like Thanksgiving when the local grocery store is practically giving crock pots away yeah. for like eight or ten bucks, and then buy uh, a cheapy crock pot there and some wax cheese wax. It lasts forever; it doesn't go bad. Then dip it, dry, dip it, dry, dip it, dry, dip it, dry, and you want to do that oh 20, 25 times until you have a good seal of wax on it, and then shove it in. A nice, cool area around 50 degrees, you know, and uh, I mean, you know, 45 to 50 degrees. Uh, so a lot of people use like a wine refrigerator. Yeah, or a root cellar. Yeah, root cellar. Just I let it get better. So bad. Okay, we'll talk about root cellar yeah, later. Yeah, later. later. That's, a, that's a different. That's a different conversation. That's a long conversation. How to build one in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Why not make it above ground? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, just... Put your cheese up, and then after a while, age it, and then now it's aged cheddar, right? Your ricotta, you can can it, you can pasteurize it. So if you don't, and you should be doing that before you sell it anyway, is pasteurize it. So it doesn't, uh, it's not going to go bad, right? You can wait a couple of days. If you're going to be doing cheeses, ricottas, butters, stuff like that, roughly 65 to 70% of your sales anyway are going to be online. They're going to be through social media. They're gonna be like, you're gonna be like telling people, hey, I'm going to town. You know, I'm gonna to be, I'm gonna be, I have to run errands and be at Walmart, blah, 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 blah. So I'll be on the west side of town for the next couple hours. You need to let me know before 10 a.m. on Tuesday, right, that you guys wanna meet up somewhere and I'll bring a cooler full of stuff and you can, you know, pick it up. Mm -hmm. If not, then you offer shipping opportunities yeah. and everything else. But as far as local stuff, then you can people can meet yeah. you up. Meet there are plenty of uh, local Facebook businesses that I, you know, I'm affiliated with, or you know, I, I like to purchase their products, and they have, you know, you can place an order on Marketplace now or online or on, on I'm sorry on Facebook and let them know, hey, I'm gonna go by and pick X amount up, you know, on X day or whatever, and they'll tell you like when their window is for pickup, and you go and pick up your products, and I mean, I see a lot of people doing that, and I'm, it gets pretty busy. Not super, super good uh, good with bringing everybody and their mom over to your farm. Yeah. 
Um, and only because let's start. This is this just the feral kind of survival prepper kind of podcast, right? So we don't want everybody and their mom knowing exactly where the farm is at. Right. Right. A general location, lots of pictures, stuff like that's great on social media. But everybody and their mom knowing where your farm at means when everybody's hungry, they're going to come to your farm. Right. So not not the best thing in the world. Also, you don't know what those diseased ass people are bringing over to your house. Yeah. Right. Like they might have some chickens at their house. But their chickens have mites. And now they've got the mites on their clothes and they go and look at your chickens and talk to your chickens. Your chickens have mites. Or they could have brucellosis or anything like that in their cattle at home and they bring it to yours. Or something with their goats and they bring it to your goats. And so, uh, especially people with biosecurity, like 101, yeah. is you need to be very careful. Most animals that are domesticated can pick up things like COVID or Rona, um, any of those, the COVID. So, like a regular common cold. As well, uh, a flu, stuff like that. So if a person comes over that's sick, they could get your your birds sick. They yeah. could get your goats sick. They could get your animals sick. So that's something you really want to worry about. So biosecurity. Yeah. Meet you definitely people, set just, up at farmer's markets. Yeah, you know. and meet people in town. Mm -hmm. but, and but, consistency is key. So maybe there's just like a, a like particular spot that you like to set up at. Yeah, we're moving about. We're, we're going to be an hour outside of town. So it's a pretty significant drive for most people. Right, uh, but I work in town, and I'm gonna I'm there three days a week. So those three days a week, it's not a big deal to go. Hey, I'm gonna be blah 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 at such and such time. Here's my schedule. If y'all want to pick something up, you have the opportunity to do so on X X day and X day. And shipping. There's, and shipping. And you can ship out. Yeah, shipping is not a big deal. Shipping is always should always be on the table. It's very easy. It's very cheap. Um, if you use a, 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 a like, what is it, Post-it.com or mm -hmm. the one that we use all the time, that they send you all the materials for free. Oh, yeah. That one, I love it. I love it. You just print out your, your, your stuff, you hit call for pickup, and they, and they send it right off. If you build an online, um, like, Shopify account, mm -hmm. you get a massive discount on shipping. You print all your stuff there, and you call for a pickup. Yep. It's beautiful. It we is. don't do shit. It was nice. It was nice. We would just put our packages at the door. We had our camera system, so we knew when their packages were, were picked up, and, you know, we just kept track of everything, and so it was really convenient to have it set up that way. Yeah, it, it, it works out. It works really well, and it's when you when somebody buys something, it would, we had a little thermal printer. I think it, I think it was like 68 bucks, 70 bucks. Yeah. Um, and a huge roll of paper. There's like 400 printer labels on it, and uh, when somebody buys something, it would just and print out the, the label. That was actually a really good. Yeah. The irritation of it. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it so many times. It yeah. print out the, the shipping label. It prints out, the, then your, your printer itself would print out your, your invoice. You'd match the two up and you go pick out what you needed, pop it in a box, throw the label on it, and call for pickup. Yeah. It was, and, and the pickup was like, I think when they charged us two bucks, they charged us two bucks to pick up everything that was at the house for that day. Right? Which was totally worth it. Which is totally, you're not getting to spend yeah. two dollars in gas going to the grocery store. Time starting your car, you spend two dollars yeah. in gas. So it's like not even worth it. Especially if it's like 105 degrees. Yeah. Just can you, can you ship cheeses though? Do they ship well? They ship well. Okay. They ship well. You need to do a little insulated box, which is really really easy. You can buy that insulated foam. Just the rigid insulated foam. Yeah, I've seen hey, that. Remember, I made those little templates, mm -hmm. I, and then uh, I would just cut it out with a razor blade and just mm -hmm. and just put it in there. Boom. Yeah. And I shipped stuff that was frozen or cold all over the place, and it arrived frozen or cold. So uh, yeah, you just calculate that uh, during the summer you're gonna add five bucks yeah. to every shipping thing, just for the cost of the material for the for the insulation and the cold pack. And the cold pack you can buy in bulk online on Amazon or yeah. eBay or something like that. There's little cold packs. Now, I will give you a pro tip on the cold packs. Is the cold packs, you need to you wrap them up in newspaper. It increases the thermal mass, and the newspaper absorbs the, the liquid that would, that would come off of the humidity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So it works a lot better. Um, have you seen where they, or, or, you know, one thing that I thought about, that I just thought about, was um, beef jerky. Yeah. So certainly back to, like, beef products, cuts, mobile butchery, butchery services, classes, you know, um, but beef jerky, you know, that I think that it, it's shelf stable for a long time. Uh, people pay top dollar for it. Oh, yeah, I literally went to a 
gas station, and it, it, it rhymes with muckies. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and it, it, you know, it's always a cool experience. You know, so it's great to see how they branded everything. But the price of the beef jerky, Ooh. I was just like astonished by how much it gone up. It was like thirty one dollars a pound oh, for beef jerky. Damn. Yeah, it was like ouch, but I still bought some. Damn, that's expensive. Yeah, but I mean, the droves of people like they're purchasing beef jerky and other items and stuff like that. So I just think of that like on a smaller level, right, on a smaller scale. Like if that's something you wanted to do and you wanted to make your own products and sell them, then you know I think definitely beef jerky is is a good one to to monetize. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how. Because it is a meat product. I don't know how. Yeah, I don't know any of the guidelines and all it. that. I'm sure that there's uh, definitely, you know, some requirements there. Not exactly familiar with it. Because, again, we're starting our farm. And that's definitely on the table as far as an option for us to research and look into. Um, but we just haven't gone down that rabbit hole enough to, like, you know, advise you on that. But look at your local laws. Look at your local, you know, regulations. And then you, you guys make a sound choice on well, your own. Well, I know own. you can sell, like... A- with you, with your cattle, like your soup bones, oh yeah, stuff like that. Bones for the for for the the dogs, everything. Yeah. So there should be pretty much no part of the cow that goes bad. That thing that goes bad, right? right? Um, you throw how to treat those bones and stuff is you 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 debone everything, as much meat and everything off as you can. Throw it in your sausage pile or whatever, uh, and then you take those bones and you put them in your smoker and you smoke them until they're done. Okay. Right? And then they're preserved. And that's how, like, pet smarter yeah. wild so And people love buying dog treats. Uh, dog treats is another big one, guys. So, like, liver. Um, you can freeze-dry liver. Um, and that is a huge commodity in the freeze-dry space. Uh, dog treats. So, dog treats, animal treats, you know, freeze-dried salmon, things like that. Uh, freeze-dried chicken um, for little snacks. Uh, people love them because, one, they know what they're feeding their animal. They know it's exactly what it is. Um, and two, they, they're shelf stable, so they never go bad. Um, and people just love their animals in general. They will do anything, anything for their pets. So, so I think we've pretty much used every part of the cow. Yeah, exactly. Point, right. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. I mean, there's other things that we'll get in that we won't get into, but you know, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much, it's, it's an endless list. Like, yeah. You can pretty much use pretty much every part of the cow. It's mm-hmm. not that difficult. You could shave the skull if you wanted to and paint it and sell it as yeah. artwork, whatever you want to do with it. Hispanics so, have it right, you know, they eat a lot of the organs because they have a lot of nutrition. Um, so, you know, if, yeah. if you're a fan, go for it. If not, you know, whatever. So we've got cows. Are we going to go by height or are we going to go by size? So we go pigs or goats? Uh, we said size. Didn't we say size? Okay. Well, pigs or goats? Pigs let's, or goats. Uh, let's go about goats, actually, because right. that was an interesting conversation yeah. <laughs> over dinner. So, yeah, my wife was like, so, like, we're, we're going to do this thing where we're talking about goats and stuff like that. And, you know. and I was like, yeah, dude, pack goats are awesome. That's where you make the money I'm at. I'm like, what? Pack well, goats? I mean, pack goats. I mean, I, theoretically, like, I knew what it was. But as we went down that rabbit hole, there was things that I didn't know that I was not aware of. But it, it's actually pretty cool. Yeah, so pack goats. So, okay, there's goats are very easy to monetize. There's a bunch of ways to monetize your damn goats. Besides just buying goats, having them make more goats, and eating those goats. Um, you've got hair goats. You've got milk goats. You've got um, meat goats, goats. You've got pygmy goats. So goats are cute. They're personable. They like humans. And they'll follow them anywhere. They're just basically, they're really stupid and they're escape artists. But other than that, I mean, people are going to argue. They're going to be like, oh, no, guys. The goats are smart. My new tricks. Oh, oh, they jump. Yeah. They jump. I never knew that they did, and they did. Yeah. Like <laughs> little deers. But, uh, so, like, yeah, okay, goats are smartish, but they do some stupid things to kill themselves. So you just gotta, like, you know, you gotta kind of watch them. Now, um, let's start with small goats and work our way up. Okay. So you got your pygmy goats, you got your dairy goat, that are the, the dairy pygmies. Um, and I, I think there's the West African pygmies are the ones that are dairy, dairy pygmies. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've got your little, you got your little pygmy goats. Now they make decent milk. They make like two quarts a day, right? Uh, for, for being like little bitty, tiny ankle biters, that's pretty good. So if you want to do goat milk with tiny little goats, that's, that's great. Um, even, even the angry males are only like 70. <laughs> we have to get some. You stop looking at baby goat pictures. Oh, They're adorable. 
One of the cool things you can do with your pygmy goats, though, to so not only socialize them, but do some life enrichment with them, is goat yoga is a big thing right now. You can rent your goats to a yoga studio. They'll fit the little baby pygmy goats. You put like four or five of them in a big dog carrier. You drive them over there in the morning. You leave them a little, little like half a leaf of alfalfa or hay and a little dog dish of water. And uh, you let the uh, people maul your goats and climb all over them or be mauled by your pygmy goats for, say, like, you know, 100 bucks a day. You know, well, I mean, a pygmy goat's what? Like, you know, locally here, I think they go between, like, 40 to 100 bucks, depending on, like, their heritage and whatnot. Um, so you your your goat's paid for itself after the first go. And that yoga studio also gets to, like, hey, Instagram the crap out of have big goats. You know, you get to do a whole bunch of cool stuff with them. It works out really well. Stop looking at baby goat pictures. I want one so bad. I want some. Some. Yeah, we can have baby goats. We'll have baby goats, okay? But you need to be, you need to be here right now. Okay. I and let's baby goat attention. pictures. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Paying attention now. Yeah. So you do the goat yoga thing. That works out really well. Yeah. Uh, a little petting zoo for your farm. You can rent them that. to photographers, too. You rent them to photographers. There's a billion ways to do with with baby goats. Baby goats are adorable. They sell really well. They have twins and triplets. Um, they're not, in my opinion, worth eating as there's very little meat on them. I wouldn't let you. They're too cute. I've eaten them. They're just very little meat on them. No. It's not that much. Uh, so let's, so let's move up. So we're going to move up from there. Let's go into the milk goat breeds. So you got your milk goat breeds. You got your, like Alpines, your Kikos, your, the weird one that starts with an O. The Swedish Oberdai, I believe is what it's called. Um, yeah, they're really cool. Uh, those ones are going to be your best kind of pack goats. They're fleet-footed, kind of decent-sized frame. Same right there. Yeah, you got Alpines. So Alpines uh, are kind of one of the ones. Oberhasli. 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 The O ones. So, <laughs> oh, bad. The Ober ones. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, they're great. They give, like, you know, all, most of these guys are going to give, like, one to two, one, one and a half, two gallons of milk a day. Uh, so that's, that's quite a bit. Um, the Alpine are currently the ones that are the most popular for pack goatism um, because they can grow really awesome Ibex-style horns that looks really cool Instagram-like for going out there and, hey, look at my pack, wild pack goat. It's not wild, guys. It's going to follow you like a puppy dog anywhere you go. Naturally, if anybody's had goats before and been walking out with your goats, your goats line up behind you and just follow you wherever you go. And that's how it does. One of the cool things about pet goats is that goats can carry uh, 50, uh, about 25% about of their weight for 15 miles. Very easily, right? Without really breaking too much of a sweat. So if you've got a 200-pound goat, you got, uh, you know, 50 pounds of weight that the, the goat can carry. And uh, you just even it out, 25 pounds on each side. And these goats are, like, big boss, man. They're, like, yeah. like, like I'll show you pictures of them. They tough. They're going, they're like, yeah. Terminator goat. But, you know, people have people go pack, backpacking with these guys. Yeah. And they'll have, you know, three goats with them. I would have mine all decked out. Yeah. Well, you got three like goats. Mad Max. You got three goats with you. And, you know, so so you have 150 pounds of extra gear plus whatever backpack you're wearing. Or you don't even need to wear a backpack at that point. I wouldn't wear one. Screw that. I'm, I'm walking already. I'm, exactly. I'm the guardian here. <laughs> the go, I'm the goat guardian. But, Can uh, I say leader of the goats? Yeah, leader yes. of the goats. I yeah. want a shirt that says that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, pack goats. Now, if you're going to sell your goats as pack goats... Baby pack goats, just simply because you put the word pack goat in it, are 500 bucks. All day. All day. I can do that all Not day. Not even really trained. Like, just with, like, to where you have gotten them used to having a... I would, like, dress them up and take pictures and then insta them. Like, oh, really, yeah. Like, exactly. Pack decked out. So just because you have, like, two, two... Even little baby goats, you just have, like, two tube socks full of rice and a little saddle. And, and you, you just put it over the top of their back. And they get used to that when they're walking around and just banging on them. And then that's pack broke for a baby. Okay. Right? 
it's I've cute. seen they get used to walking around with that, and it just it just don't your weight, and so it's. No, yeah, you can put a bell on them. Just so they're used to having stuff pop them, like, as yeah. they walk, like, on their side, so they don't freak out and run. Yeah. I mean, once their pack broke like that, those are $500 baby goats. You you took it from a 25 to, you took it from, like, a 35 to to $100 goat. That took it to a $500 goat in, in two weeks of playing with it. Wow. Right? Not bad. I'm now, laughing in my head. Sounds Full so grown. Trained pack goats are like five seventy five to like a thousand dollars. So uh, it depends. Like if they're on the smaller side for the breed, like real light, and they can like carry like twenty five or thirty pounds of weight. The the bigger the heavier goat is, the more it's going to be able to carry. You, now you want to stay away from using your meat goats because they overheat. They're too big. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like your um, your boar goats. Are not good pack goats. They just they eat too much. They're too big. They're not. They're not designed to to get out there and do stuff. You know. Wow, this but, is like a whole lifestyle. Like Packgoats.com, right? Yeah, like they play like goat courses. Yeah, you can take yeah, a course. Goats for sale. Goat club membership. There's wow. a North American Pack Goat Association. Pack Goat 4H. There's a store with all kinds of merch, like. Pack supplies. I don't know what that is. It looks like a. That I'm looks scared. like a. No, it looks. <laughs> it looks like a nipple. Like, okay. Uh, I, was like, what? <laughs> I don't know what you're thinking. But anyway, um, yeah. So this is a whole like thing. Wow, that looks pretty. Another cool. cool thing about the pack goats, guys, is you can throw them in the bed of your truck. You just need to have a little wooden cage back there, or even, uh, you know, uh, uh, they could go wherever. You can put three or four of them back there, and then drive them to wherever. Now, they, now, one important thing to remember about pack goats, pack goats are not allowed in national parks. Um, they aren't allowed in national parks that what have... What is that? They're not allowed in national parks that have goats or wild goats or wild sheep in them. Because they don't want to risk spreading disease. disease. Okay. You know, back and forth, either way. So, uh, but if you like, but a lot of places don't have, um, a lot of places have public land. They have, a magazine. they have a magazine. I know we're we're slacking. We should have a magazine. <laughs> they have a goat people magazine. Yeah, it's pretty I, hardcore. I need to subscribe like yesterday. That's pretty hardcore. That is hardcore. Wow. Okay. Right. Yeah. So they've other. So they've are what what I mean. It sounds like we're fangirling. We kind of are because we love the marketing of the, behind this. Um, look at the the shirts are legit. The shirts are legit. Are legit. Oh man, that's so All cool. Right. So okay. uh, we're fangirling a little bit because we like the marketing behind it, but. You know what? You can take advantage of that marketing because they've already done all of it for you. Right? Yeah. They've already done the marketing. Yeah, good ideas. Yeah, but you can also go like, hey, pack goats are a thing. Go to this website. Yeah. If you need supplies, ha ha. Yeah. You know? So there, there's some, you, you know, it's like when somebody's like, oh, pack goats, what? But uh, yeah. So pack goats. Interesting. Now, okay. Um, there are hybrid, like alpine and boar hybrids mm -hmm. that... Um, and what, I, what I'm saying, Alpine, just, just, you could have substitute that for Alpine, the actual breed, or any of the lighter boned or medium boned uh, milk goat breeds, right? It's just Alpine are really popular because they have the big old, big old horns and they look cool, like an Ibex. Um, so they, there are hybrids that can carry more, you know, uh, but you don't really need to go as big as a boar. Boar, just, you're not going to want to run a boar goat anywhere that's warm. You can probably get away with running your um, your regular pack goats in Texas and Arizona, not on 105 degree days, but that would be like, mm. you know, most of the year. Yeah. But um, your little, uh, your boar goats are just going to overeat. They're, yeah. just, they're way too, they have a layer of fat on them that, that just holds in way too much. Way too much. Look at the deposit. So on I know. The so goat. I'm seeing. I'm seeing that they require a deposit. So that's a good idea, guys. Uh, deposit require a deposit for your merchandise, right? You want to make sure that your product is protect, protected or at least paid for if anything happens. Um, so you have, um, yeah. So that's really cool. They have pack goat gift cards. Right. That's, that's insane. They have okay. a, a, a that's just, like pack goat deposit on a baby. Yeah. Seven hundred and fifty dollars. Wow! Look at this. Like it's a pet goat excursion. Like where are they going? Uh, on trails. I don't know. Wow. Somewhere. Where are they from? That's a, that's a very sophisticated setup there. Right. Interesting. Pet okay. goats. Pet goats. It's a Do thing. Do whatever a pet goat does. 
Like, uh, the bone. cool thing is, is you don't have to bring food for them. Like, what does the backyard eat? Just whatever. Yeah. Right? They like, forage. Right? They forage, yeah. You got to bring some water. But if you plan out your excursion, right, where you have places that have water, it's not really that big of a deal, right? Because they can always just... You know, walk along the rivers. And yeah. Stuff. Drink whatever. Pretty cool. Yeah. I cool. would probably be pretty um, cognizant of your need to protect your pack goats. Because pack goats are, I mean... Now, when goats that are normally herdy kind of goats, like pack goats and stuff, now, when they get startled, they come together around you, you know? Like, they, they'll come together around you and kind of face their horns out to, to, to produce a perpet, per, like a protective thing, right? So you kind of want to, uh, you want to kind of be careful. Um, I would carry a firearm, but I carry a firearm everywhere. So I would definitely protect, I would definitely be very, very cognizant of protecting my goats from things like wolves, coyotes, mountain lions, bears, uh... Yetis, yeah, humans, yeah. And if you don't want to go down the pack goat route, you can also, you know, there's meat, cabrito, you know, uh, cheese, cheese, soaps. Yeah, um, there's, there's all, all the stuff. same stuff you can make from a cow. You can make from yeah. a goat. So, uh, also, oh, hey, renting the goats out for brush clearing. Oh yeah, that's, that's a thing. Out, yeah, that's a thing. It's a big thing. Even the government pays for it now. So there's there's a couple ways to do this. There's the all there's a contract where. They provide the, the the customer provides the fencing, so they have an all fenced in area already. Then they provide the water source, and so all you do is load your goats up in a trailer, drive them over there, drop them off, close the gate, and let them just kill all the Eat brush. Yeah, yeah, just munch, munch, munch. Uh, and then there's the other kind where you provide the fencing and you provide the water source. That one's much more involved. It requires you to go check on your goats every day, basically, um, and. Uh, that those you're gonna want to take goats that are already broke to a hot wire. I imagine it's more economical to do it that way versus getting your land like cleared with like you know renting equipment or hiring the. A- uh, it is. It's much more economical. It takes longer to have the goats do it. The goats do a very thorough job because they they tend to kill everything that they eat. Like okay. like they'll eat it all the way to the bottom. You know, like all the way down. Yeah. If they find something they really like, they're gonna destroy it. Is it, um, like, friendly versus not friendly? Yes. Too? One of them is okay. eco-friendly. The goats, super eco-friendly. The goats aren't going to tear down the trees or cut the trees up or anything yeah, like that. that They're only going to eat stuff from about five feet up off the ground because they can stand on their back legs. I definitely want a couple of goats. So, so they're going to eat five eat. feet up, down. Everything up, down. Yeah. Where, and then uh, you don't have to worry about them tearing up the ground or hurting the root structures of your plants or your trees, stuff like that. How big, how high of a structure should people build? Because they do, goats jump. So I've found them on the greenhouse roof one time. I would find them in the compost bin. I would find them on the hood of my vehicle. And, I mean, they jump, so. Yeah, well, that's because they have somewhere to go. Right. Right? They're not going to jump. They don't do well jumping over a fence. Okay. Right? Um, And so a hot wire fence, like four strings, a hot wire. Yeah. Yeah. I find that that usually works pretty good, provided they are broke to the hot wire. Mm-hmm. You don't want to just put up, spend all this time, put up a four strand or three strand hot wire around an area you want to put your, your goats in on a contract and then release the goats and the yeah. goats just go up to the hot wire and go, huh, and then just walk right through it. Yeah. Right. So uh, because they're not broke to it and then when they get startled, they just run forward and run right through it. So, uh, you definitely want them already broke to the hot wire. No, the hot wire is not their friend. Yeah. Before you take them out there. And one of the ways to do that is I've taken aluminum foil and put some peanut butter in between two pieces of aluminum, two strips of aluminum foil, boop, and put the aluminum foil over the hot wire. So they go up there, they, they start, they because they, they want the, the, um, the peanut butter. Okay. But the aluminum foil is super conductive to, to electricity. So mm-hmm. they go up there, they tuck their noses to the aluminum foil, and blah, Okay. Yeah. Not, <laughs> not a good time. Yeah. And because it was in the front half of their body, they back up. If, if they get if they get electrocuted between basically nipple line back, they're going to go forward. Yeah. Anything from like the front shoulders forward, they're going to go back. They're going to go backwards. Okay. They're going to back up. So you definitely want to make sure that what hits the electrical fence first is is before their front shoulders. So they don't run I would run also suggest it. like gaming cameras, right? Like just put a couple of cameras out yeah. there. Just... 
game you cameras. Your, your make sure, yeah, yeah, make sure nobody's gonna take your damn goats. Yeah, I mean, at this point, like, put a collar on your damn goats and put a tile tracker on. Them. Oh yeah, tile trackers or air tags. This stuff is so cheap. You can see what your goats are doing. All of a sudden, your goat's doing 75 miles an hour down a highway. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Where's my goat going? You know your goat's been kidnapped. Yeah. Right? So, uh, yeah. GPS tracking your goat's not a bad idea at all. Not a bad idea at all. Um, yeah. And those can those little programs can be pretty lucrative. There's entire companies now that are based around dropping off. Like friendly land clearing. Yeah. That's but like, interesting. There, there's, there's several of them here in Texas. Mm -hmm. Just in the, the, the area. I mean, up around Austin, it's a huge thing. Yeah. The city of Austin uses like they are they they almost constant they have a contract where they employ about two hundred freaking goats year round. Nice. Okay, I want to get in on that. Yeah. All right. But we're definitely gonna have some goats though because they're gonna help with the milling and everything and keeping our land you know pretty. So yeah, and they're cute. And they're cute. And they're cute. And they're cute. <laughs> a whole like as long gang. as it's a pack I want a whole want gang a of like goat. pygmy goats and I'm gonna name them like some kind of gang name like I don't know like. But, uh, like, I don't know. Goat gang name? Yeah. Like, Drop it in the comments below if you have a great goat gang name. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking suggestions. The Clovens. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Cloven gang. Yeah. Cloven hooves. That's well, hilarious. Unite. But, uh, yeah, those guys, uh, yeah, goats, scissors, goats' his eyes, goats' his scissors, goats. Wait, what's okay. a bunch of plural of goats called? What's a herd of goats? Is it a herd of goats? The, what is the name for a herd of goats? Name. Yeah, is this called a herd? A, a tribe. tribe. Yeah. A tribe of goats. It's called a tribe, a trip, or a herd of goats. A trip, a trip to tribe. A trip, a trip to tribe. Trip of herd. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know. We'll figure this out. Tribe of goats. I like yeah. tribe of goats. All right. So we've we, we've covered goats. I think yep. we pretty much covered it pretty quick. Now let's go to pigs. Pigs. Uh, All right, pigs. Now, okay, this is going to sound bad. I like to boomerang pigs. Um, so there's, I'm going to hurt some feelings. There's no such thing as a teacup, teacup or micro pig. It doesn't freaking exist. If you're going to have a teacup or a micro pig, they will give you feeding instructions for your teacup or micro pig to keep it really, really, really nutrient um, devoid. It just doesn't grow that way. And that's how you can keep your little pig at 40 to 50 pounds. It's because they just, uh, as an adult. I hate that. Is that you just, it's starved. And you, you've screwed it up for life. And that's why the micro pigs look weird. Like their faces look weird. Like yeah. all squished and stuff. It's because they're just, their bones didn't grow, right? They're like malnourished. Yeah, they are very, very malnourished. Um, and so what happens is these people go and they buy and they see the adults, you know, and instead of a normal pig having a litter of like 10 babies, these adults are only having like two or three because that's all they, their body can handle. And the people go to the farm and they see all the pictures. Oh, look, it's like a 40 or 50 pound adult. They take the damn pig home. They start feeding it. And next thing you know, in six or seven months, they have a, you know, 300 pound pig. And they're like, what happened? Right? Yeah. And uh, now they're looking for a home for Wilbur. And uh, it's really hard to find a home for Wilbur. Because Wilbur no longer thinks himself as a pig. He thinks himself as an alpha human. And he's kind of a dick. Right? Like, he well, doesn't have any respect Why do you gotta people. go, like, Charlotte's Web? That's it was like the first pig web. voice. Like, that, that gets it was me the right first, in the field. It was the first pig, right pig word, pig name I could think of. I couldn't think of another one. I was going to call it Candle the Pig because of the candle right there. <laughs> but, like, what else am I going to What else am I gonna name it? All right. Pork chop. Pork chop. Okay, so a little pork chop. Is uh is now 300 pounds and, and just tearing everything up and totally not afraid of humans because it's been raised it's like you know human all the time. So you, no respect from little pork chop. So uh what are you gonna do? Better try to find somewhere for it to go. So I've always been like, if you buy a pig from us, you always have the opportunity to bring it back for free. We'll take the pig back. No problem, no questions asked. Once the honeymoon period is over. Yeah, exactly. We'll take we'll we'll take little friggin' pork chop back. Um, I call it boomeranging. Uh, they go, they love on it for a while. They pay to feed it, house it, everything else like that. And then they bring it back to you. And you, that, that cuts out a lot of the feed and housing you had to do. Um, and uh, a lot of the times they bring it back with 
Oh, this is Little Pork Chop's favorite toy. This is Little Pork Chop's favorite food. This is Little Pork Chop's favorite snacks. Here's his bed. Everything like that. You're like, great. Yeah, totally. It's going to be great. They bring him back ready to be bacon. Yeah, they bring him back all fattened up and ready to go <laughs> right, in the, right in the freezer. And, uh, you know, they bring Little Pork Chop back. And then Little Pork Chop goes to freezer camp shortly thereafter. Because Little Pork Chop's dangerous. Little Pork Chop doesn't know that he's a freaking pig. He'll bully you around. He'll push people. That's a lot of the reason they get to get rid of him is because they just, they're like, you know, screw it. I'm in charge of this house now. I'm bigger now, y'all. <laughs> I don't think people realize how dangerous pigs are. Oh, they eat people. Yeah. yeah. They kill the shit out of you. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So a little pork chop goes right to freezer camp and then you just repurpose the toys for the next one. They can buy, <laughs> they, can, wow. they can buy a little piggy, rent a, rent a pig and a, or buy a pig <laughs> with its, uh, with its toys and the toy kit and everything. There you go. It's got a bed. It's, it's got some. This is his favorite toy. Uh, I, I know it, it sounds terrible, but uh, it works really well. So uh, that's that's boomerang boomerang pigs. You can apply that. Well, we'll talk about more animals you can boomerang here in a minute. Uh, pigs. Uh, you can sell pigs on shares. That yep. works out really really well. Just like we did with we talked about with the cow, with the cow where you can sell like half a pig, quarter mm -hmm. pig, stuff like that. Works out super well. You can use pretty much everything but the stoink on a pig, right? Yeah, except the snout. No, you can use the snout as dog treats. Everything but the oink. Okay. Like, you can't use the oink. Interesting. Like, because it's a yeah, sound. That's all, that's yeah. all you can't use the oink. That's funny. Yeah, everything but the freaking oink. So you've got, like, you know, the intestines, everything like that are casings for sausage. Yeah. You've got um, lard. Oh, man, making the good kidney lard. Oh, it's good stuff. Um. So everybody's pretty familiar with, with like butchering hogs and everything, right? One of the cool things is, is that you should be able to raise your hogs for practically free. Every town has a little grocery store yep. or a restaurant, restaurant or a uh, like a quick trip or a 7-Eleven that has like a food department, stuff like that, right? So you can go to those places and talk to the people and be like, hey, listen. Uh, you're the overnight, you're the over, you work nights, right? You know, you guys are in charge of rotating all the, the produce, the, the pre-made sandwiches, all that mm -hmm. stuff like that, right? And you're, uh, I'll bring you a garbage can. I'll set it outside. If you just, you make it a convenient one with the rolling, so they can just drag it through the store and throw everything, all the used produce in there uh, that they don't, they, they're going to rotate out. And, uh, I'll take care of it. I'll dump it and everything. You just leave it right here. Just rotate it out the back door. I'll come pick it up every morning. You know, and just make it part of your roaming routine to go pick up the newspaper and uh, your, your free uh, food. And you could even like, it could be like the closed loop program, right? Like yeah. no waste, reduce your, your footprint. You exactly. Know? It saves them. Your on, footprint. Yeah, it saves, they get to they get to say they're eco-friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to take care of the trash. Don't worry. I mean, don't ever complain about free food from them. So if it was like those pre-made sandwiches that come in, in the wrap already. You don't lick a gift horse in the mouth. If you're already getting like 75 pre-made hoagies in a bag that are each an individual wrap bag, spend the 10 minutes your own self and unwrap the damn hoagies and feed them to your animals, right? Take the meat and cheese part and dump it off into the chickens because they're carnivorous as shit and dump all of the, uh, all of the, the, the bread, the bread and, lettuce, and everything else, tomatoes, all that to your pigs, pig. right? It's, you know, or to feed the, the, the cheese and the, the, uh, meat to your dogs, or, or, or you know, but probably I'd stick with your chickens. Yeah, they can they can eat anything. Yeah, so, yeah. So don't don't shoot the gift horse in the mouth and make it a big deal over it. If some other stuff that ends up there occasionally, like the guy was drinking a Monster Energy drink when he was doing it and throws the can in there, don't complain. You're getting hundreds of pounds of free food, you know, per year. So why the hell would you bitch that you get one can of Coke in there, right? Yeah, whatever. Adds extra flavor for the pigs. I don't give a shit. Just fish it out. Like, yeah. You're dumping it anyway. Like, you're going to see it. But you'll take anything. You'll take expired milk. You'll take, uh, like, expired juices. Anything like that. Because you can take that milk and that juices and stuff and dump it over grain. And now you've taken that grain and added a ton of nutrients to it. And made it so the animal wants to eat all mm -hmm. of the grain. Right? We've done that a time or two. We've done that many times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it works. It's called slopping. Uh, it's great stuff, man. Uh, you can do that at little bistros and restaurants. You're not going to be able to do that at like Arby's or McDonald's or Burger King. 
because they're going to have like you know they're going to have corporate policies. Yeah, they already they have their processes, yeah. so don't even. They won't let you do any of that. But like your little mom and pop stores, little stores, stuff like that. Yeah. Little grocery. Little stores. grocery stores. Yeah, for sure. Little stuff like that. Bribe them if you have to. Hey man. Bring what, you some products. I'll bring you some. I'll bring you some stuff. I'll bring you some dozen eggs every day. You know. Mm -hmm. Uh. Uh, or I'll bring you eggs, whatever you want. It's not people, not everybody's gonna want I a dozen eggs. eggs. Right but like you know, or like, hey man, I'll, you know, I brew my own beer. I'll bring you, you know, a six pack of freaking beer, whatever time, every time it's ready. Plus you know, eggs. I'll just bring you farm stuff. You know, you'll be surprised how open people are to doing one little thing that you know, like that, because it's not gonna impact their day at all. If they have a really nice trash can, not a shit trash can, a nice trash can with wheels on it, they can just pull around their store and throw everything in. And people love high quality farm goods. They yeah, and really, it makes really their good. life it makes their life easier. And they don't have to worry about trying to pick up that heavy container and dumping it later. Uh, it makes your life easier. And you just think, I'll take any food product. Any food product. And that way, if you find something you don't like or your animals don't like, oh well, you can dispose of it. Right? Because it's still organic material toss it in your compost pile. It'll be great. For you, it's great for them. Win, 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 all the way around. So you should always be able to feed your pigs and your chickens pretty much without ever buying any sort of food. Like, uh, um, except for starting, like, you know, yeah. your, your chickens and your stuff chickens. like that. Chickens so, are little velociraptors. They are. They're freaking meat-eating monsters. They really are. So that's your, that's your pigs, right? I think that covered kind yeah, of Yeah, that pretty, covered pigs. Kind of covers pigs. Yep. So let's talk about, let's see, duck, or duck, turkeys? Turkeys. Ooh, turkeys. Yeah. turkeys are fun. So turkeys are uh, really good at making money. Uh, they're a little just ever so slightly harder than a chicken to process. Uh, by slightly harder, I mean an extra two or three minutes. Uh, they are, they go for a lot of money. We do our heritage breed, uh, breed turkeys at a hundred bucks a pop. That's what it is. If you want a turkey from us for Thanksgiving, our heritage breed turkey is a hundred bucks. I don't care how big it is. It's a hundred bucks. That's what it is. We guarantee that you'll get a big ass Heritage breed turkey. It's going to be 100 bucks. Yep. And I start, I like to start mine earlier than everybody else uh, and then not power feed them. I like to feed them high quality food, but to make sure they have a lot of forage and a lot of natural, like grasshoppers, bugs, and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of vegetables and fruit because I want them to be super, super tasty. But, um, and then we'll brine it for you. And this is where you get into value-added products. Yeah, you process it and brine it for them. That's yeah. just amazing. So I got those bourbon, those bourbon reds. Remember all the big bourbon red turkeys? Yes, I yeah. remember Turkey Tom. They're freaking <laughs> awesome. So the big bourbon reds, uh, bourbon reds, my favorite. Uh, they're personable. They're very, very sweet. They're hearty as hell after they're about three weeks old. The first three weeks of a turkey's life is spent trying to come up with creative ways to kill themselves. And uh, that's just saying it nicely. They're stupid as shit for three weeks. I don't do broad-breasted turkeys. I have in the past. I find that just like Cornish game hens, they are a bit uh, sensitive and die pretty easy. Um, I like heritage breed turkeys. Everybody likes heritage breed turkeys. Uh, Bremen egg turkeys are great. Look, holy crap, they're charging 106. Wait a second. We're going to probably... Change our I want prices. to read you. I want to read you. Who's doing that? Who's just? This. They're just a grocery store online. Is hundred and six. We're getting we're way undercharging for turkeys. Eight, and that was an eight pound minimum for one fifty nine. An eight pound shitty. Ours are like twenty pound turkeys. Yeah, sixteen pound is two ninety. Holy shit, we're way undercharging. Holy crap, I feel used. Because I mean, ours are like 20, ours get huge because like we start them a month or two early. And so we're, you know, we want them to be really big. And we've always had people go, man, there's the most flavorful tender turkey we've ever had. Uh, and, but we would, we're charging like a hundred bucks a turkey yep. and making money hand over fist because we buy the pulps for eight bucks a pop and the little baby, baby turklets. I call them turklets. Yeah, you call them turklets. Yeah, the, the, buy the little turklets for eight bucks a pop and then... Have them free range on whatever. Like, they eat all the garden waste. I feel like this is a recent development, because even the eggs are going for $5 an egg. What? An egg. A Holy turkey egg. So sweet that's baby Jesus. Wow. Wow. We're doing something. 
It's been a minute. We're going to change that. Jerky farm it is. Jerky farm it is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, we'd buy them for eight bucks a pop. We'd feed them out. We'd feed them, uh, like, you know, from a lot of grocery store waste, a lot of fruits, a lot of vegetables, a lot of apples, a lot of melons, a lot of lettuces, a lot of stuff like that. And then just let them eat it, all the bugs they wanted. And then I wouldn't really pack the grain on them until the last, like, 45 to 50 days. The last 45 to 50 days, it's almost exclusively grain. Uh, they, before then, they've had tons of protein and calcium to build up their frame size as big as they can get it. And then now you're packing on the calories on them, which is grain. You basically want to think, how can I feed this turkey Snickers bars? Right? And like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, except with minus the chocolate because it would kill them. Yeah. So just like, you know, just, just packing on fermented grains, a lot of fermented grains for making beer. Um, a lot of sprouted grains, just as much stuff as I can to do as much uh, as much available calories to them. And you watch them just go plump, plump, like super, super fast. And uh, at that point, when we're we're done processing them, they're you know they're 20, 20 pounds a piece for the for the males and sixteen ish for the females, 14, 16 for the females. And you know we're getting charged hundred bucks a turkey now. I think we're gonna probably charge like one hundred fifty. Uh, whatever. Okay, so uh, I was just looking at something. So on average, like some some purpies, uh, some turkeys, <laughs> burpees, turpies. What is a turkey? Um, some turkeys take uh, nineteen weeks to grow, and they're about forty pounds. And so, I mean, we just saw the price it was like for a nineteen pound turkey. It was it was what two oh nine or two ninety? Wow. Six hundred bucks. Six hundred bucks for a forty pound turkey. That's insane. Where is it getting six hundred bucks for? I mean, you're I mean, you're just doubling with the cost, you know. There's no way. There's, who's gonna yeah. pay that? Who knows? Who knows? That's interesting. Okay. That's ridiculous. Anyway, if you want to go ahead and pay six hundred dollars for a turkey, go ahead and hit us up. <laughs> <laughs> I will sell you. <laughs> I will personally. I will personally smoke it for you and everything. Will, brine it or process it, brine it, smoke it, deliver it. We'll we'll have it not delivery because that goes all your money. Yeah, you know, true. Round trip tickets are expensive. True. But we will vacuum pack it and ship it to you. Already cut up. You just have to heat it up. I think smoked turkey is like my favorite over fried turkey. Well, it's always it's always been a big debate. Well, what but, we were doing is we were really charging people like twenty five. They buy the turkey. Then for twenty five extra dollars, we would brine it for them, you know, and uh, which was really what I thought was a, was a deal for them. We'd brine it for twenty five dollars, and then for like you know an extra like you know twenty five dollars, I'd smoke it because once we had the smoker already going, what's throwing another bird on there, right? For the big smoker, so uh, you know for one hundred and fifty bucks, they got us brine smoked turkey and it's ready to go on Thanksgiving. Yeah. And they just had to pick it up the day before Thanksgiving. Didn't let anybody come pick up shit at the house on Thanksgiving. But they come to the gate and pick it up on the day before Thanksgiving, yeah. all nice wrapped up in foil. And then they just had to, uh, you know, heat it up. Uh, it required, I, I sent them with a little printout of heating it up. You know, leave the foil on for, you know, pop it in the oven at 350 degrees for an hour. Uh, take the foil off and tint it over the top and, yeah. you know. And uh, then leave it on there for another, bump the heat up so it crisps the skin. Smoked turkey is my favorite. It's like a giant turkey leg. It's yeah, it's amazing. Really good. I think we're going to revise and I think we're going to charge a lot more. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. But I mean, we do a lot of yeah. turkeys. Uh, back in the day, me and my buddy, we'd do, you know, 100 turkeys or so uh, a year. And it was, I thought it was good money, but I think I think we left like a lot on the table. <laughs> Now I realize we could have made like three or four times the amount. I'm like, I could have been, could have paid off my truck <laughs> in one season. Like, that's ridiculous. And we were still making money hands over fist. By the time we got done, we, we calculated it out. It probably it cost us about $35 to feed a turkey in, all the way to, to be an adult. And that was only on like three acres of land. Because um, we just grew the really tall grass. And we let the birds in there before we rotated any other animals in there. Right, so the birds got in there and ate all the bugs. They ate all the seed tops off of everything, 
And then we'd let in the, the goats and the cattle and they would eat everything else. You know? Yeah. So we had a great rotation going. Okay, so we talked about turkeys. Um, moving on. You can also sell turkey feathers, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Bunch of stuff. Uh, chickens. 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 So, uh, or ducks. Sorry. Okay. Ducks. 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 Duck eggs, obviously, are a big seller. Yep. Selling baby ducks. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that you're going to add artificial lighting to your ducks to make 12 hour cycles uh, on the month before Easter. Okay. So, what is that? Like April? April, March, March, when's Easter? March? Uh, April. So, March Easter April. is like the first week in April, I thought. I don't know. That's not, no, it said Sunday, March 1. Back up. Just hit the backspace. March 31st. Okay, so starting in mid January, you're going to want to change your light cycle to where it, uh, it has 12 on, 12 off. Right? With just artificial light so that your ducks all start laying. Mm. Okay, because they, they like lay to that. Then you're gonna duck eggs take what 28 days to hatch. I think it's take 20 days. So your ducks take about a month to hatch. You're gonna take your duck eggs. You're gonna just incubate as many duck eggs as you can. Just all of them. Just months. It doesn't matter. Just farmyard freaking mix of duck. You're not going for the cutest. You're not going for a specific breed of duck. You just want duck. Okay. So uh, now when that magical week of Easter comes around. You say, baby ducks and baby chickens. And you sell the little bastards for 25 bucks a piece. All right? $25 a piece you deliver. So you'll go into town with just a box in the back of your truck. Like the back seat of your truck full of baby chickens and baby ducks. And uh, you'll just go into town with that. And you'll just have little boxes. You can just, just a little box. You put them in. Here's your duck. Here's your chicken. Here's my, here's my card. When you're done with them, you can always return them for free. <laughs> Boomerang. Boomerang. Boomerang the duckies. So now uh, the duckies going to come, you know, they're going to love on the ducky. They're going to play with the ducky. If it dies, ah, you made 25 bucks. If it, uh, if it lives and they did a really good job, they took care of it and everything. Now you've got a teenager duck back and you, you haven't had to worry about heat lamps or messing with it or raising yeah. it or food. Or anything else. And it'll come back to you with a cage. <laughs> and with food. And with all of its favorite toys. <laughs> I love ducks. I love yeah. raising ducks. So you'll They're just quite take, messy, though. You'll take that little duck. Yeah, no, sure, little Sherman or whatever. What's a good duck name? Sherman's fine. Sherman, okay. Yeah, no, Sherman's welcome home, little Sherman. <laughs> and then you take little Sherman and you yeet him out with the rest of the ducks in the duck pasture. And you collapse his little cage, and next year you sell it in a kit for for the next person who's going to be uh, taking the duck. So yeah, once you realize how messy ducks are, they're like, no thanks. They're yeah, like, nope. it's about two weeks. Yeah, it's about I two weeks. Do it about two weeks. Yeah, yeah, it's about two weeks. But that's the that's the two weeks where the ducks are the most fragile. They're going to go and live in some nice person's house who's going to maul them for two weeks and take care of them when they're the most likely to die on you. So they're gonna provided that little old Myra doesn't like. <laughs> yeah, provided they survive. Yeah. The 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 I guess. What is it be like trial by the fire? Snuggly thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> provided it survives the snuggles. Yeah, provided it survives, it's gonna come back to you as a very hardy duck. And <laughs> once they get to a certain age, though, ducks are pretty hard to. Yeah. After about three weeks old, two weeks, three weeks old, they're they're, they're pretty hard to they're kill. Pretty hardy, unless there's a. Coyote that Damn, is coyotes. that is you know Jesus literally stalking your ducks assholes so uh but yeah no your uh the ducks ducks are pretty easy. so boomerang the ducks just boomerang them. aren't that duck eggs they go for great they're great like we we know what five bucks a dozen on them ten dollars ten dollars yeah. a dozen on them uh duck eggs are great people who are allergic to chicken eggs can usually eat duck eggs without a problem they're a great source of nutrition. Uh, they their dark yolk indicates that they hold more antioxidants, so more omega three fatty acids, fifty percent more vitamin A than your regular standard chicken eggs. So definitely, if you if you're looking to up your game as far as a nutritional source, duck eggs are better than chicken eggs. And baking with duck eggs. Oh my god. Yeah. So all the professional bakers, you can't really make a real good angel food cake without duck eggs, because duck eggs are they whip up stiffer and make a real stiff meringue. So what they do is they make the really light, airy, complex, thick 
cakes, you know, and muffins and stuff that you get when you go to like a professional bakery. They're using dehydrated or dried duck eggs or even fresh duck eggs. Um, those they're using that. That's why their cakes are different than the ones you make at home. Because they're using duck eggs. Yeah. Right. Really interesting though, if you are um, if you have a history of diabetes or a heart disease in your family, probably not a best idea to incorporate them like on your daily diet because they have a higher cholesterol content. Um, so just be careful there and be mindful. Or you could just live fast, die young. <laughs> yeah, you only live duck once, eggs. Right? Duck eggs. Angel food cake with duck eggs. Duck oh egg God. food cake. Yeah, so ducks, boomerang. Same thing with your chickens. Chickens take 28 days to hatch, I think, too. So uh, yeah. 21 to 28. Uh, so, yeah, boomerang your chickens. The, that month, you know, j starting in January, change the 12 12 cycle so that you can um, get your. Get get your chickens laying eggs, and then just let them let just barnyard freaking mix. You're just going for cuteness factor. It seems like the lighter colored baby ducks and chicklets uh, they seem to uh, sell better. So like you know, just the cute little yellow ones and uh, stuff like that. Also gray ones, like uh, red ones, just anything but black. The black ones don't really sell so well, um, and I think it's just because they don't look pretty. You know what I mean? Yeah. They like really pretty little spotted ones and bright Easter colors. So uh, that works out really well. I have always liked boomerang, boomerang animals. Yeah. It was really right cool back. that we're, we're seeing that it's like a trend and like a fad is um, yourself like, uh, what what is it? Like a self-checkout farm stand, really? Um, so you have like people are creating these little farm stands and making them all cutesy, Instagrammable, but they're also selling like their products, this their cheeses, their... Yeah, definitely side quest. This is a goat. Okay. You should have said side quest. Goat side quest. Yeah. The goat, the goat, the wandering goat of side quest. Okay, so <laughs> wandering goat. But still, that's another opportunity for you to be able to sell your eggs without you having to go somewhere. Or all your farm goods. Yeah, all yeah. your farm goods. Yeah, I saw as long as you don't live. Yeah, or... as long as you don't live like in like like downtown Chicago, where everybody's yeah. just gonna steal your whole farm stand and turn it, <laughs> into, a, turn it into a tiny crack house. No. So, but like, like as far as, but most people they're pretty honest, like. Yeah. They're, especially if there's a fake security camera <laughs> that keeps them honest. Like, uh, most people are pretty honest. Yeah, I like to think the people in this kind of community are honest, yeah. Johns. It's yeah. not, you just but just make sure to secure the uh, the bunny box. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like a little drop box that you can't access or yeah. anything like that. that kind of thing and they cool. also give options to pay, like, Venmo, Cash App, you know. Which that is works perfect. great. Yeah, don't make it difficult for people to pay you so um don't just say oh i only take cash because who carries cash nowadays no one exactly so be mindful of that but yeah a little self-serving farm stand is is apparently all the rage now so you just put a little i like, definitely want one put a little put a, we'll just put a little cooler in there yeah like a little like one of those mini fridges yeah and just have it full and put vegetables and crap in there at all times and yeah yeah i think i like it we'll do it yeah it sounds sure. like fun we'll see what happens um so chickens, you got your eggs, you got your chickens, you're selling baby chicks, you're uh, selling baby chicks for Easter, you're gonna, you, that you're planning on boomer, having them boomerang back to you. You can uh, process, people can pay you to process their chickens. Yeah, as know? long as it's not for resale. Yeah. As long as it's not for commercial resale. Um, one of the ways to get around that, like we were talking about earlier, is that you can sell um, the, uh, the chickens for X amount of dollars. Right. And then you can sell uh, a, a class on butchery. Right. So what I've seen people do is charge between 5 and $10 a bird, right, to show up to someone's house to do butchering, to mm -hmm. like mobile butcher, butchering. And uh, so they have 10 birds. They go, all right, this class is going to cost you 100 bucks. Cool. Yeah. And then they're like, all right, here's how to butcher. <laughs> so, and they help you, too. Yeah. So, yeah, it's Slave a win all around. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. They have to participate. Okay. Pretty cool. Works out pretty good. Um, uh, another uh, source of income for your chickens is going to be uh, the hackles of the male chickens, like the roosters. They have that really long feathers. You can take their hackle and sell the feathers off, like the, the skin. You take the skin off around the around the neck of uh, the dead chicken, obviously. Uh, and then you just stretch it out, pin it on a board to dry. And then, um, well, I take it and I 
put the whole hackle and everything in a mixture of 50-50 salt and borax. Um, and I just had it laying down inside there. Uh, so it's got full contact with all of the skin itself. And then after two days, I take it out and I pin it onto a piece of cardboard with some paper towels behind it so that it absorbs any liquid that comes off of it, which is normally going to just be fat. Um, and uh, once it's dry, it's now shelf stable for basically a, a forever. Um, and you can sell those to fly tires. They will make flies and sell fishing lures and stuff like that. They're only going to be like five to ten dollars. Yeah. But I mean, it's 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 you know Still, I mean, four or five minutes up. worth yeah. of work and a pair of scissors. Yeah, and it all adds up for ten yeah. bucks. You know, so it it all adds up. Just every little thing that you can do that is going to add up for me. And uh, that's that kind of covers chickens. I think. Okay. I don't, I don't know what else you could do. We ate them. We made feathers, flies out of them. We we boomeranged them. We we sold them. We butchered them. We butchered them. Okay. Quails. Quails. These are my favorite. So quails are gonna, quails are gonna be really good. You can sell baby quails, which so quails are a super fast turnaround animal. For 15 days incubation time. 14, 15 days. So they go and then six weeks after they hatch, right? They're laying eggs. They're already laying eggs. So these are the cortonics, cort cortonics, whatever the one is. What are they called? Cortonics, 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 quail. Whatever. Okay. Well, I tried pronouncing it. I give up. Um, yeah, those guys. Uh, they're really, really great. Um, they're great as a food source. They're super quiet. You put one male to every five females in a cage. You have a ton of eggs. You can sell the eggs, pickled eggs, fresh eggs. Uh, people who are allergic to chickens are not going to usually be allergic to the quail eggs. It takes like three quail eggs to make a small to medium sized regular chicken egg. Um, where's the do, scroll down there and see if you can pronounce the damn. No. What is it? The, oh, you use a touch screen too. Mm -hmm. Cortonics. So just go like this C O U R. T O N I X. Mm. That's X. That's an S. That's an S. Yeah, X. How do you spell that? Cotternix. Cotternix. Why am I even asking you? I don't know. I'm the worst when it comes to that. What did you just mispronounce? I, don't know I, <laughs> I had a bad glitch and I mispronounced something so horribly that I don't even want to repeat it. <laughs> It was amazing. <laughs> yeah, Cortenix, I don't know. Whatever, those guys. Yeah. Uh, they lay a bunch of eggs really, really fast, and they're really easy to take care of. 17-day incubation period. Ah, well, it's 14. It depends on the, it depends on the heat. Like it's 14, 17. Something's like on the, hard, on the high side. Yeah. Uh, but they're really simple. Fast, 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 fast. So uh, they're really fast turnaround. They're, um, my opinion, a really great money maker. Um, because you can sell little baby quails, like, I mean, you could sell the processed quail for like, you know, three to five bucks a piece. Yeah. Um, restaurants. Yeah. Um, restaurants buy them. Yeah. Local, local people, your local community. Local community buys them. You can eat them. Kentucky Fried Quail is amazing. amazing. You just like, basically, you can go online and find like a Kentucky Fried Chicken knockoff, uh, for as far as like the, uh, the recipe, the, the recipe goes. And then just do the entire quail and deep fry it. It is awesome. It is awesome. It was probably why you fell in love with me. I mean, that, that is actually why. Actually, he made me hunt my own dinner our first date. Hunt my own dinner. I've never been hunting in my life. I never shot a gun. I never shot a gun in my life. And actually, <laughs> I was suspiciously good at it, naturally. Yeah. Uh, I and I'm like, suspicious, suspiciously good at a lot of things. I went to axe throwing the other day, and I like kicked ass and I was like what the hell who was I in a past life anyway I'm um, a hamster. <laughs> a very my, angry my hamster. husband's a very angry hamster <laughs> yeah they're like a silly rabbit guinea pig because <laughs> uh, anyway. you're cute but you're bitey <laughs> I am bitey yeah. don't piss me off anyway uh, <laughs> so he had me hunt my own food I shot a shotgun for the first time and it was a 12 gauge yeah. and so I enjoyed it so much like hunting running after quail even though he's like you're never going to catch them I didn't care I would jump out of the truck through the cactus uh, through, through the, the cactus mesquites. I was wearing like long boots and like jeans and you know so I was pretty well so protected 
And so I didn't care if I was running through Mesquite or whatever. I was good. And um, I We're was We're in just, an open-air Jeep. So I'm like, yeah. I'm like, don't jump out. Just hold on. We'll drive around and cut them off to the next road. No. And then you can just stand there. Like, and when they run out, shoot them. F that, I'm out. She just like, she, we'd be driving along. And she'd see quail. She's, Tuck and roll. Just, <laughs> just, just straight up, just, just jerk herself out of the truck. Yeah. I'm like, you don't realize we're doing like 10 miles an hour. I didn't care. And she just like, rah, runs I didn't off care. through I the was, bush. I mean, he wanted a, a, you know, apparently a huntress. And I, that's what I was. You <laughs> well, know? it was like, it was one of those, uh, like, like trial by fire things. Yeah, well, that was one of those like, like, girl, you're either gonna pick up the pace and live on my ranch and farm, or oh, geez, or you know, you're gonna be scared and run yeah, away. Right? He was like, oh, dream weaver. Yeah, it was really like, when, yeah, when you're like running through the forest shooting at the quails, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. I'm sitting there watching, like, man, I hope she doesn't fall over and die <laughs> and shoot herself with the shotgun. <laughs> Because you, you were really just running and shooting at the blue. So if nobody's familiar with the West Texas blue, blue, uh, blue scaled quail. And those little guys can run like 15 oh, miles an hour. They are fast. Like straight through cactus and straight through everything else. She just balls out running again, running, chasing, shooting, so much firing fun. the shotgun, having a great time. The dogs are going crazy. They're like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> They're <laughs> just was, running in circles. I was shooting so much. Like, I literally had, like, a huge bruise on the inside of my um, arm. From yeah, the you kick. went through, like, yeah. 250 shells. Yeah, from, like, the kick. you got, like, six quails. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was. It really was. I was having a blast. I was like, just open a beer. I was like, this is better than TV. <laughs> it was great. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Anyway, so we caught our quail, or I caught our quail, and then we went back and we cooked it. So we had to prepare it and everything. She's all taking like Instagram photos of the quail. Look at the quail. Look no, at the quail. I was not. The quail. Look at the... Yeah, I oh, still yeah, got just, them. Just once. I took one photo, yes. You got all these pictures then, of the quails. And then I'm like, so then I was like, ah, time to process some kick the garbage can. I think I turned white when he said that. I was like, what? You really want me to what? And <laughs> so I was like, oh my God. What so I just grabbed the first one, ripped the little head off, pull off the freaking feathers, wings. Clip the wings, clip the feet with the scissors, and I'm like, they're done. And it's I followed quail. suit, and I did. Yeah, you did great. great. Yeah, I did great. Yeah. We had quail. It was delicious, and that was when I fell in love with quail and my husband. Yeah, uh, I am not. I did not suggest you uh, do a first date like I did. Please um, don't, because you never know how it's going to turn out. Like, uh, you know, trying to it, the difficult part I think for me was trying to convince a woman to drive. Where the nearest neighbor was seventeen miles oh, to yeah. come out to the ranch, and I uh, promise that I promise I'm not going to shove you in a whale yeah, and make you rub lotion on your right? skin or anything. Just, uh, I think I had to meet you at the road with a flashlight so you could even find the road to the house. Because <laughs> it was like you're driving up and down the road. I'm like, yeah, I see you. Well, how do you see me? I was like, because there's not been another car come down the road for about four hours. Yeah. It's dark. We I see your head We were for months yeah. and like video chatting and everything. So I felt pretty comfortable. I knew where I was located. Definitely had GPS tracker on my ass. Like I don't know if you could probably do that these days. Just to me, that's really that's so creepy. Yeah. You would have to be careful. Yeah. Cause, there's a lot of people who like. There's a lot of creepy people nowadays. Back then, ah, people were nicer. I think people who got shittier over the last like couple decades yeah well i lucked out anyway yeah. um so yeah dinner was great and that was when i really you know just really got into quail so and she's had a murder boner for quail ever since yeah like she'll yeah. see quail drive down the highway quail. and be like quail i'm like where'd you see them they're right over there she's oh so really for christmas them. of you know uh follow that up our first date and everything and then we spend the holidays together and christmas i got a 20 gauge shotgun yeah i got had ice. less of a kick I special ordered it. For you special ordered it. So that it had the right, the right, the right length of pole and everything. Yeah. And so um, that was really nice. It was a, a big difference when hunting. So, females, I definitely suggest a 20 gauge versus a 12 gauge, unless, you know, that's all you want. So, have. you want to, so as far as that goes, you want the woman's uh, length of pole, uh, the Mossberg um, 20 gauge shotgun. So, it's a youth 20 gauge shotgun. But they have a special option to set it up for women. And so it is slightly more robust. It's got prettier tooling on it. 
and it has a slightly longer stock than it would for the, mm -hmm. the kids. And it was definitely lighter. And a much lighter, and it comes with two different barrels. Yeah. So it's a short one and a long one. And it, just living in the country, guys, you have to be mindful of walking outside because you never know if there's going to be a rattlesnake, a coyote, or a bobcat, or whatever you have. Right? So just be prepared. So I just got used to, like, lugging my Mossberg around, and I had the little straps. So I would just strap it to my back. Um, but, yeah, there was a couple of occasions where, yeah, I did come across some pretty aggressive rattlesnakes. So... You still got the yeah. <laughs> the rattles right so, so, one secret about me is that I'm like uh, the predator when it comes to rattlesnakes, and I will keep the rattle, just like the predator kept the spleen. So, yeah, the spine. Yeah, spine. the spine. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. The spleen. So, well, he, he, ripped, he ripped the spleen oh. and like got the spine right. So <laughs> it was very dramatic. Anyway, uh, so yeah, I keep the little rattles, and I don't know, I don't know why. I know, it's kind of weird. No, it's not weird. They're in a jar. Yeah. There's... Some people actually, like, gold plate them, and I'm like, okay, we'll go that far. Not that far. But they're in my jar. Not that far. So, uh, that's that's pretty much quail. Um, quail are, like, something you're going to sell as a pet to people, so they don't really boomerang. Um, but selling a baby quail, I usually sell them a buck a piece all day long. Up until they're about three days, uh, three days old. After three days old, I start selling for buck twenty-five until they're they're two weeks old. They're two weeks old. They're two fifty a piece, and then uh, from then on, there's no difference between a if they want to buy a fifteen-day-old quail or a six-week-old quail that's ready to go into the pot. They're five bucks. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, and so I don't, I don't, and you get people who try to price gouge you if you're trying to sell them as breeders. Like if you're going to go tell people you're going to buy some as Twelve because you want to breed your own quail. Those five dollar quail will suddenly become fifteen or twenty bucks a pop. Yeah. Because they know they're not going to get any more sales off of you, right? So yeah. they just try to get that last couple of bucks from you, and you never see you again. Where instead they could just sell you them for the same price that they normally sell them for, and then try to make a make a relationship with you. Like, hey, I'll help you and teach you whatever you want to know. And blah blah blah. We could be friends. Blah blah. You know. Yeah. I prefer to, to, to go the fringe route and try to make a community yeah. than try to try to gouge everybody. The only so, thing that I withhold from like those types of events or anything is obviously our recipes. Our recipes are our own. They're our unique recipe to us. And so we hold those close to the best, I think. Yeah, those kind of things I do kind of hold a little bit close. I mean, um, we'll use like a gener general one, right? General recipes for this and that or whatever, yeah. whatever your preference is. Um, but as far as like our products, like we really uh, do not share our proprietary recipes, you know? Uh, we worked hard on it. Yeah. We've yeah. we've done a lot of uh, research. You know, we've made things. A lot of things were inedible. Process. <laughs> yeah. A lot of things were inedible. We had to throw them out. I mean, it's all a learning process. That's why we tell you guys just to take a chance and just give it a go. You know, if, if you, I mean, you have literally every form of knowledge at, fing at your fingertips. So yeah, if you have, don't if, hesitate. If you have, um, if you have a mess up and you have animals, the animals will eat it. Yeah. The chickens will eat it. The, 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 it's the a circle of life. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. Um, one thing about raising quail, though, is make sure that you're giving them enough protein. Yeah. Uh, quails, if they don't have enough protein, they pick at each other. They pull each other's feathers out to get the little protein on the end of the feather. Oh, interesting. So uh, they're pretty They're pretty Kind of like monkeys with the mites. Uh, uh, sort of. Monkeys with like, the fleas and ticks and, fleas and mice. Ticks and stuff protein. Yeah, kind of. But meaner. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, then they make each other bleed. Ouch. And they check out the bleeding spots. Yeah. To get more protein. So the best way to do that is just to feed them like a game bird feed or like a turkey feed. Like, uh, you know, just so it has like 28% protein and they're going to go. Yeah. So other than that, they're bulletproof. Just feed them. They, and they can eat that crumble, that 28% crumble their entire freaking lives. Like Snickers to them. Yeah. Up until they, they go into the pot. There's just no reason to feed them anything else. They're really easy to take care of. Uh, I think the last animals we're missing are uh, bunnies. Yeah, bunnies and bees. Bunnies and bees. Yeah. So bees are kind of your deal. Yeah, bees yeah. are my so deal. So let's, let's talk about bunnies real quick. Bunnies are the easiest thing to boomerang in the entire world. Bunnies boomerang every time. I've never had anybody buy a bunny from me and keep the damn bunny. People buy a bunny, they might it might, it might they might have it for six, eight months, a year. But it's coming back. It's always coming back. Nobody, everybody's attention span for a pet is usually before they give it up and make the, like, a kid's attention span for a pet. It, it, even if it's a, like the bestest kid in the entire world, their attention span is way less than a year. And then by then, mom and dad are tired of, uh, you know, dealing with it. And they remember, hey, 
Those nice people that sold it to us said, they'll take it back, no questions asked. And so they come back to you with the bunny cage, its favorite food, its favorite toys, and everything. And now you have a bunny! They can either go back into your breeding cycle if it's a you know big, healthy uh, adult, or if it's just a mutt, uh, right into the pot. So uh, rabbits are delicious. They're uh, 98% white meat. They taste, I mean, it's going to sound stupid, just like chicken. When I make chicken noodle, noodle soup out of rabbit or chicken, nobody can tell the difference. They can't tell the difference if it's chicken or rabbit. Interesting. Uh, I, the entire rabbit tastes like chicken breast. Yeah. There's no gamey parts on a rabbit. There's no oh, dark Oh, yeah, I meat. did have rabbit. Yeah. Yes, it does taste like chicken. It's exactly. just the It's same. even like, I want to say it's like spongier than chicken. It's, it's like chicken breast. Yeah, it's, it's like chicken breast, yeah. It's all just one big chicken breast. Yep. Um, yeah, and so I'm a big fan of rabbit. Um, I used to can tons of rabbit soup, rabbit stew, all sorts of stuff. Uh, now, wild rabbit is not the same. Wild rabbit's almost all dark meat, and it's very gamey. But, like, domesticated rabbit is great. So the Texas A&M uh, ones are great. The the TAMU, those would be the, the Texas A&M University rabbits. They're heat-resistant. They're bred uh, to do really well the heat. They come in a variety of colors. Um, they're really, really soft and tame little bastards. So, uh, um, and I'll, my favorite part about them is that you're, you're not going to get just all white rabbits, right? Yeah. Is that you breed them together, you'll get some that are that are gray, some that are silver, some that are brown, some that are spotted. And so they make good Easter pet rabbits, right? Yeah. That are going to come back to you <laughs> as uh, meat rabbits. So I don't specifically breed something like a lion head or anything like that because they have long fur and they don't do well in the heat around here. I tend to only breed stuff that, that does well in the heat around here. And if I get a rabbit back from somebody that, that they've had it for a year, I like to isolate it for a little bit to make sure that it's going to be, you know, not like, you know, sick or anything like that or have any diseases. And then I'll put it back into my breeding rotation because they've already had it for that long. I can, you know, might as well put it back in your breeding rotation, cycle out somebody else, pop that one in. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, rabbits boomerang right back. And then when it comes time around next year, you have a cage and everything's set up already that you can just, those little cages, those little wire cages that they sell everywhere for rabbits, they fold flat. So like the guinea pig style cage yeah. with the plastic bottom, they stack all together beautifully. You can just put them in the corner of your barn, fold the tops flat, and then next time, you, next year, bring them out, give them a quick spray off, put your bunnies in there, and sell them as a kit for hundred bucks. Yeah. Bunny water bottle that kit. Hundred bucks. Bag of food. There you go. There you go. Take it home. You're gonna get it all back yeah. <laughs> in a couple of anywhere between. Two weeks in a year, you're going to get it all back anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and they've done all the work for you, raising a rabbit. So you can also sell the pelts, um, rabbit pelts. Rabbit's pelts are going to grow from the shortest day of the year to the longest day of the year. The rabbits are going to be growing their fur from the short, longest day of the year to the shortest day of the year. They're going to be losing their fur. So um, just basically wintertime, it's cold, and you can save the furs. Now, they're very, very easy to learn to tan. A little bit of the tra trapper's tanning uh, solution. Uh, goes a long way on bunny furs. Bunny furs are only going to sell for about five or ten bucks a piece, um, so they're not really like a huge money maker. But it's like every time I look at throwing one away, I was like, I'm not going to throw a ten a ten dollar bill away, you know? Like no, I, no, I'm not going to throw a ten dollar bill away. And uh, now I'm saying they were five or ten dollars a piece back in the Mountain Man shows in the '90s. I imagine they're twenty five or thirty dollars now. Uh, and I'm definitely not throwing away, you know, $30 bills, uh, three $10 bills in the trash every time I want to process a, uh, a rabbit, especially if tanning the hide takes me, you know, 45 freaking minutes to do a five-gallon bucket of rabbit hides. So if I'm going to do, you know, 20, 25 rabbit hides and it takes me, you know, four to five minutes a piece on them, why throw them away? You can clean them with a pressure washer. You flip them over, you step on them, and you use the pressure washer to... Uh, on a low setting, don't use the crazy Ryobi 28,000 PSI pressure washer. But like one that basically fits on the it's battery power, does work great. Um, just a little cheapy pressure washer. Flip it over, stand on the hide, and then just pressure wash off all the excess meat. Take it, hang it up to dry. Once it's not so damp, put it in your borax to pickle it. Then take it out of your borax, give it a quick rinse, put your tanning solution on it. Fold it up, 
put in the put it in a Ziploc bag for you know however long it says. That's usually a week. Take it out, then you let it dry, and then you put it into a um, bag. And I use uh, those you know those wool balls that you put in the, the dryers, the dryer mm -hmm. balls. I put it into I put it I put them into a sack. What is it called? Like a like a gunny like not a gunny sack, but like a laundry sack. Yeah. Like a military laundry sack. That's, that's exactly what I use. And then a drawstring sack, put a bunch of dryer balls in there, throw it in the dryer, just on with just normal tumble without any heat. And that just softens up the fur. Then you take the furs out, stack them, and you're done. Like after 45 minutes of tumbling the dryer with the dryer balls, the wool balls, they're nice and soft. It's all been worked out. And now you have a whole stack of pelts, 20, 25 pelts at a time. Works out super, super good, super fast, super easy. The entire process time is, you know, a week, but actual work time is maybe an hour. Yeah. And I think that's pretty much everything there is about rabbits. Rabbits are super easy. You don't ever need to buy rabbit food. No reason to buy rabbit food. They'll eat every weed in your garden. They'll eat twigs. You you, oh, you yeah. off if you're your farming, tree. You have so much like so much like extra foliage or things that went bad or, or just excess or or not excess, but like when you're cleaning things, you know, you believes and stuff, you can feed that to your rabbit. Yeah, you, the mess that your goats make from their hay. You just rake that up, you know, and um, just put it in a wheelbarrow, rock the wheelbarrow back and forth a few times. Any goat poo will fall to the bottom, and you can just use that hay to feed your dang rabbits. Yeah. Like, uh, there's so much you can do with your rabbits. Um, you never have to buy food for them. Now, lactating females, I will give a little bit of grain hair and there too. But uh, even then, just if, you, if you're growing your own corn or your own field corn, stuff like that, some of that works. If you're baking bread, uh, what is bread? Bread's grain, right? You, if you're picking up bread items from a bakery. Uh, mm, you we know, used to give them a lot of the excess squash. Oh, yeah. Excess yeah. squash was a great, we great so one. much of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they remember, I'm pretty sure they, our listeners remember the horror stories. Yeah. Right. The, the Careful with food, squash. The, the food pantry sees us coming and flips the sign around the <laughs> clothes. But, uh, yeah, that... Uh, Rabbits are really, really easy to take care of. You should never have to buy them anything. Just make sure they've got really good airflow. Uh, don't worry about them being cold. They're, they're not going to get cold. Uh, but worry about them being hot. So good airflow, lots of access to fresh water. I strongly suggest automatic watering nipples hooked to a reservoir, like a five-gallon bucket, where we use those 25-gallon totes. And you put them up there and just put a little pop a nipple in the side of them with a little bum, and then hook our... Uh, our uh, water tubing up to those, and the water tubing up to the little nipples, and we caught a day. It worked out really, really easy. I believe one of our our small animal monetizing um, podcast has pictures of that nipple set up and the rabbit set up on it. Yeah. So uh, that works out really, really well. Um, and that's bunnies. Like, yep. What a, we got bees. We got bees. bees. Okay. So I'm super excited because I'm going to get to call myself a honey farmer. So monetization of beekeeping. So there's so many things that you could do. Uh, you could sell the, so honey and wax are a huge commodity um, that it's, it's in high demand. So you could do honey straws, skincare products, table honey, honey butter, mead, your honey beers. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to having a couple of apiaries uh, to start. And for those of you who don't know what apiaries are, they're actually like the little hives. Um, so, and they're the boxes. So you get to have, you know, so many, you know, however many you can keep up with, I guess. Um, so I'm going to start with a couple of them and, um, yeah, you can also do classes and advisory services. You can sell bees, you can sell the starter hives. Um, and then honey is used in food products, candles, skincare, all kinds of stuff, medicine, uh, pollinating bees are essential, you know, to the health of our planet. So, you know, I'm all for like, you know, having a healthy bee farm. And so I'm uh, just really looking forward to that. I'm actually most looking forward to people like, hey, where's where's Vanessa on a Friday night? And I'll be like, oh, I'm just, you know, spinning my honey, you know, drinking a, as I drink a beer, you know, whatever, just enjoying some some badass music and, and just keeping to myself and doing what I love. And so looking forward to that. Um, and yeah, so other products that you could do, are obviously, you know, the royal jelly, chapstick, you know, honey, um, honey syrup, you know, so there's a lot of things you can do chapstick with the beeswax, 
Um, you know, a lot of a lot of products you can use with beeswax, actually, like even the lotions and skincare products that, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but yeah, honey is all around like really, really good stuff and a really great seller. So uh, looking forward to offering that as part of our, you know, one of our products. And that is it for honey. Well, that's all that I have for uh, beekeeping. Did you need to add anything to that? Uh. You talked about selling pollen? Yeah. Well, I didn't really get into the selling pollen because I really don't know yet. Um, well, you could sell the pollen for people who are... Trying to pollinate, right? No, where people are doing um, allergies. They put in the pills. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you got the pills for that. Uh, you, you covered honey straws. Honey straws, yeah. Which are yeah. a big seller. Super easy to make. Because they're yeah, it's super, super easy to make. Um, and, and people love them for like their tea and stuff. Yeah, they're just, and I mean, it's such a tiny amount. They sell for like a buck a piece. Yeah. Like, <laughs> such a tiny amount of honey and honey straw. Uh, Definitely yeah. looking forward to those. And people, and people love them. They just suck on them. They, yeah. they walk around. I know. Them. I'm like, if I cannot eat them, I'll sell them, you know? They're really they're amazing. quite nice. Yeah. Um, and then selling honeycomb. Yeah, honeycomb. Yeah, you put it into the jar. Like mm -hmm. people like people just eat on the honeycomb too. I've yep. seen that happen quite mm -hmm. a bit. Um, it's a lot. Yeah, there's and, you know, so table, much cool stuff. Table honey, you know, to yeah. reduce your use of using sugar. Like if you want a healthier alternative, like table honey. Have you seen it where they crystallize the honey too? Yep. And then they make it like in like basically like powdered candy. honey. We have powdered honey right away. Oh yeah, we do have powdered honey. We have honey. a whole, we have a we have like a five pound sack of. Uh, yeah. I guess what. What like, do we use it for? Uh, <laughs> maybe some type of marinade of some sort or oh yeah when i was making the uh the um the dry rub the drug the, the, it's it's the rub for the chicken and fish oh yeah yeah okay yeah that's what it was it was the one for the yeah like it was and then I think great we even oh, use it on, i think we use it on ham too yes there's uh it's like salt and dried honey and yeah uh just it's got like some peppers and stuff in there but it, it, it turns into, when you add the liquid from the meat, turns it into a glaze. And really good. Yeah. So what do we got? Uh, so, I think we've got, we covered bees. Like yeah, we covered bees enough. Pretty much everybody knows bees. Yeah. Bees are pretty exciting. easy. What do we got for uh, news of the day, sweetie? So one thing that I wanted, that caught my attention that I thought was pretty interesting is like urban sprawl and how it's a thing. Um, it's always been a thing, um, but it's more evident now. So um they, there's a lot of farmland that's being converted into subdivisions and industry. And that's a huge concern because we're definitely not, we're reaching a point where we're not balancing out. So, you know, when you think about how we are growing as a population, we're growing, you know, between 20 and 30 million people a decade. Um, so if you're reducing the amount of farmland and reducing the amount of food that you're growing, then where's the balance? And we're all out of sorts, right? Um, so that's very concerning. So again, you know, I want to encourage our listeners if, if they have an idea about homesteading or even it doesn't have to be a full blown operation, guys. It could just be your own operation for your own household. I highly encourage it. Um, you know, a lot of things that are going on with like even the currency now and, and you know, um, the United States and what, what they're what we're all experiencing here. Um, it would just be smart to like start growing. Like I, I literally, we went out for dinner and I had a salad and I'm looking at my salad bowl and I'm like, uh, I'm going to grow everything in here. So that reduces that cost. Right. Um, the only, and literally like the only things that I would have is my meat products that I'd have to, and even those we would process our own and all that. So it felt pretty good to know that we can make this right. As I was eating it, I'm like, we can make and grow all this. Um, so that made me feel secure. And so I'm just, I just want to encourage our listeners, you know, if, if you're thinking about starting even a home garden, go for it. Um, if you, if you think about getting a couple of animals to raise and harvest and process, go for it. If you have questions, reach out to us. We're here. We're, we'll be happy to answer any, any emails or, you know, messages that come our way. Okay. Uh, we're, let's talk about uh, some cool stuff in the news. Is that they figured out that they take ethylene. Now, ethylene, everybody's kind of familiar with those, those little bags that they sell to ripen fruit. Yeah, that was pretty cool. The little green bags that they, they already have ethylene impregnated mm -hmm. that, that you can buy at the grocery store, put your, your semi ripe fruit in, and it ripens the fruit. That's using ethylene gas. They found that if they take seeds, they put them in the dark, and they expose them to ethylene gas. So, like, they, they basically just fill a jar full of seeds and ethylene gas. And then, then they take those seeds and then they expose those seeds to light. And then they put the seeds into the ground to grow. 
they're getting a 266 to 460% growth rate increase. And the seeds are more resistant to salinity, um, changes in environment. They have more glucose, sucrose, starches, and everything. They're just, just look at the, the pictures here that we're looking at are just ridiculous. Yeah. Like that, this one's at least 300% bigger. It it's, really is. It's, it's really, really, really cool. So uh, that's pretty cool. It's another way they might be able to feed kind of the world. And if you want to look at that, it'd be on the Anthropocene New, whatever that is. So uh, that's just kind of a cool thing. Um, let's talk about, everybody's talking, right now we got Maui thing going on, right? Um, where everybody, where there's a massive, massive fires. We feel really bad for those people. And um, I mean, it kind of drives home you know, how important it is to have a bug out plan on what to do with your family, yeah. especially if you're trapped in a situation like an island where you your options are to burn or swim, right? Uh, and a lot of people did wade out into the water, as I was reading, uh, that to get away from it. But some of those people, that, that the wind shifted and they got uh, smoke inhalation. Wow. So. Um, That's terrible. Yeah. So you've got to have a, you need to have a plan to bug out and know when to bug out. Um, and just worry about keeping your family safe. And our thoughts and prayers are with the poor people of Maui. And um, we're just, it's a terrible situation for them. I was reading that they were having like 70 mile an hour winds when they were having this. Yeah. Because a leftover hurricane that passed. Uh, they have to tell into that, which pushed the fires. And uh, So in a, in a, in an island situation, though, like, what are your options to bug out? The water. Right. So your only option is the ocean, right, to bug out. So it would be keep your boat fueled up, or if you don't have a boat, kayaks. Anything would have been better. Right. Right. Then just wading out into the water is an absolute last resort because you can only get so far away. And, it and water slows down your movement, so if the wind shifts, then you have to struggle through. Very dangerous situation. Yeah, to get, you know. To get out of the 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 the, the, the smoke. Um, also, in those kind of situations, having a a good P one hundred mask with smoke filters, yeah, would, would help you quite a bit as well. So that at, if you did have to mask up and get away from the smoke, you could. Um, yeah. So just just if you live in a dangerous situation, if you live in a fire pro prone situation, uh, this is kind of a wake up call for all Americans and everybody worldwide is to have a plan to uh, evacuate your family, have supplies to evacuate yeah. your family. Um, and then now uh, we hear the news just put up news that desperate residents are looting businesses and robbing people at gunpoint for, for water. And it's only, this is what, day two? Right? Of Lahaina? Um, this is day two yeah. uh, of their fire, basically. Um, and so they didn't even make it three days before everybody's, now there's a total collapse of society going on. And what do you do? You get out. Yeah. You, your, your home's burnt. You have nothing. There's no bugging in or staying there or defending your castle. You're going to defend a pile of ash. Just leave. Yeah. Leave. Get on a boat. Go to the neighboring island. Go to the other you know, side. There are a lot of families like taking in people, having there them are. sleep on their floors. And I mean, you guys are really the unsung heroes. Like, you know, our hearts go out to you guys. And, and that's just really big of you to, to be able to open your homes to to these people who were affected by these fires. Yeah, it's not going to do any good to sit there and try to fight with uh, people if you're not... There's yeah. nothing to defend. Everything's gone. It really does look look like the bombing of Pearl Harbor. It's really bad. Um, and it also, not great news, <laughs> following not great news up, is that... Uh, Due to how hot it's been, all the fires that have been going on, the storms that have been going on back east with all the flooding and everything like that, they've had transformer shortages. Um, just with the, the hurricanes and everything else like that, uh, damages are over $50 billion to the infrastructure and uh, of America's power grid. Uh, the problem with this is, is that America doesn't produce its own transformers. We buy them from China. And we're not in the best of friends with China. And most of these larger transformers have a six-month to one-year um, uh, lead time. Uh, right now, if you deliver transformer delivery times, averaged one year compared to three months in 2018. Um, 
Now our membership is reporting wait times as high as 18 months to two years, with some manufacturers canceling orders because they don't have enough available stock to fill the orders. Decision makers in Washington Transformers manufacturers must act swiftly to address these changes, blah, 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 blah. But really, unless we started producing them in America, um, that's it. Like, yeah. But that would really suck, right? Like, so imagine if there's a situation, if you will, that your tran- your local transformer, the, the big one outside the town, blows up, and now your town doesn't have power for two years. What do you do? Bad day. Bad day. Bad so day. that's why uh, root sellers will be uh, an entirely different episode. Um, and you're gonna have to do one on solar. Yeah, and solar. Yeah. Like I'm really big on uh, the root sellers. I've been researching them, and I think they're just a great option for like even having like a bunker, you know, attached to it. Root mm-hmm. cellar, keep your food storage down there, because um, you never know. Like the biggest concern is. You know, if we didn't have power, like, how are you going to survive? Well, not only in the winter with the heat, you know, heat sources. I mean, you could build a fire and all that, right? So you have some options there. Our new but place it, has a fireplace. Our new place does have a fireplace. And we have a couple of big uh, kerosene heaters that work for us in a pinch. And they're great. Um, so definitely keep, you know, if you can access some and purchase them, just have them as, as a backup. Go for it. I highly encourage it. But in the summer, I mean, with the heat levels the way they are like it is very dangerous uh, not to have somewhere cool to go and and find shelter you know so root cellar it is so we'll have a whole episode about that i have a feeling i'm going to be tasked to build a root cellar oh yes <laughs> and i'm going to help you i've, I've gone very diy you're going to so. supervise from the back of the track i'm going to tell you how i want to design <laughs> <laughs> yeah supervise from the tractor okay uh, let's go ahead and talk about our plant and our tree of the day. So our plant of the day is going to be the Beauregard sweet potato. The Beauregard sweet potato is a sweet potato you find in the stores all the time. It's the one you are most uh, familiar with. Happy, tasty sweet potato. Very hard. Um, now, you can go ahead and go online and buy sweet potato slips all you want. They're expensive. Um, however, you take your sweet potato and you take the pointy end. And you... And you put you put the there's a pointy end around it. Yeah. You put the round end in a in a, in a, in a uh, some water. In a cup of water, right? You put the toothpicks <laughs> around it. You don't. That. I don't put toothpicks. No. Toothpicks leave the bacteria getting inside of it and oh, it, it turns into mush fast. Okay. I just put it like remember you just put them in a quart jar. Yeah. And just put water in the jar, and they're gonna sprout roots like crazy, and then oh, they're gonna put up shoots. Those shoots that they put up, those are the sweet potato slips. So you break those little those little those little slips off when they're about six or seven inches tall, mm-hmm. and then you break them off very carefully at the base where they're connected to, connected to the potato, and it'll leave a little tiny scar. It doesn't matter; another one will grow out of there. And you take those slips and you put those in water. And when those root really good is when you're going to then um, then you can put them in the ground. But one sweet potato, God, would we get like four or five hundred slips off of it over a year? Oh yeah. Like eh, I'd probably never say that many. I'd probably say maybe two hundred, because um, it I did an entire two hundred foot row off of one big sweet potato, um, and that's because I didn't poke holes and I changed the water every other day. So like uh, so the water never got a chance to get like moldy or bad or anything. I just poured the water off. Uh, take the sweet potato out, and if it was starting to look like it grew algae or anything on it, I would take just the sprayer at the sink and shh, just I wouldn't scrub it because I didn't want to spray any like hurt any of the uh, um, any any of the roots. But I'd spray it, shh, yeah, and spray the spray any of the gunk off of it, and then put it back in the jar, fill it up uh, back up with a little bit of water, and it's just plain water. It's you're not using you don't add any fertilizer or anything to it because it'll cause it to rot. Um, and you can get, you know, 50, 100 slips off of one potato. Works out great. Just find one at the store you like. Uh, it's going to work better if you buy a um, sweet potato that's in the fall and make your and you and store that one to make your slips with in the spring. It'll store just fine. Oh, yeah. They store forever. For On your counter, right? Don't mm-hmm. put it anywhere dark. Don't wrap it up in a plastic bag. Don't pop it in the refrigerator. Don't do anything like that. Just plain old on your countertop and keep it from getting bruised or the skin cut or anything on it. And it'll last till spring. 
And that's when that's the one you're going to use because any fall crop is going to be new crop, right? Any sweet potatoes you get during the during the the spring are going to have been sprayed with fungicide and um, like insecticides and 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 hormones to keep them from rooting while they were in storage. Whereas the one that you put on your counter since last you know since the fall yeah. is going to be just fine. And once you pop it in the water, it'll start producing just an absolute ridiculous amount of. Uh, your slips are going to be good to go. Uh, and yeah, you just save one from every year. Now, aging, your, turning your sweet potatoes into sweet potatoes is a bit of a pain in the butt. Um, yeah, it requires like 90 days, 90 degrees, and 90% humidity, blah, 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 blah. I am not an expert on it, nor have I ever been. Um, I just find that storing them in um, like without washing them like super, super good. Yeah. But just storing them in boxes, like in the heat, like under the porch, seems to uh, get them to sweeten up pretty good. Also, sweet a sweet potato that is not turned into a sweet potato yet, mm -hmm. where which means it's, it's, it's just a potato. Yeah. You can eat it just like a regular potato. They're just not sweet. I love so, sweet potato hash, so I Yeah, will... but you want it to be sweet. But yeah. if it's not, if, if, you, if you don't have the ability to age it correctly, to get it to convert the starches into sugars and become a sweet potato, you can still eat it just like a regular potato and treat it like a regular potato. It's going to taste like a regular potato. So sweet potatoes are pretty much the bestest survivalist foodist stuff. They're great. They're extremely heavy producers of very large guys, and they work out really well. Uh, that's about all I have to say about sweet potatoes. Let's talk about the tree of the day. This is going to be the Carmine Jewel Bush Cherry Tree. Um, Carmine Jewel Bush Cherry Tree. It says, beautiful dark red cherries. The bushes produce an attractive dark red tart, nickel-sized cherry. Fruit is most enjoyed when it's allowed to ripen to a deep red color on the bush. Great for uses in pies, juice, dried, and fresh eating. Heavy producer. Cold hardy, self-pollinating, but get two of them for larger crops. One of the good things I like about this is it's good for zone I like three to nine. So pretty much for everywhere. It lacks pH of six to seven. Um, it lacks well-drained soil. The fruit size is pretty small. Um, these guys aren't huge. They're not. They're, they produce about two years. These are going to be like a, six, like a six foot tall by six foot wide bush. You know? Uh, and it's just going to produce tons of them. So it's great for kids to pick. It's uh, it's just going to be a good storing cherry, too. So if you want to take these cherries, because they're going to be a tart-type cherry, so you can put them in the simple syrup and can them in the simple syrup and use them as, like, maraschino-type cherries, right? And uh, what else you got? You got anything else, huh? No. Nope. I think we covered no, everything. All right, guys. Well, uh, that's going to be it for our episode today. It's a little bit longer episode, but thank you for bearing with us. Sorry we didn't get an episode out for the last two weeks. We've been really, really, really crazy busy. It's also been stupid hot. And because it's been hot, we've been running back and forth, checking on the construction of the house, checking on our animals here, our animals other places, making sure that all of our stuff is growing and doing well. And um, we've just been really busy. And we're, well, we, we can't promise <laughs> during the moving process that's going to happen. We're thinking, what? Pretty soon. I'm thinking it's going to happen at the end of the month. Or at the beginning of next month. So. Yeah, so in the next... We'll keep you all updated. Next updated. two to three weeks. Yeah. Once we start moving, we might have to skip an episode. Yeah. But we'll be back uh, next week for yeah, sure. Yeah, the next one's going to be uh, monetization of farm equipment. Farm equipment. How to make your equipment that you need anyway. Pay you. Pay for itself. Pay for other equipments and pay for you. And I think at that point, we will have covered absolutely every way to make money off your farm. <laughs> right? We told you we'd make your head spin because there's so many options, so many things that you could do. Just get creative. Just, you yeah, know. you see people just throw in some row crops and then try to make a make a living off yeah. that. And and they should be doing so many other things all yeah. at once. Because, I mean, yeah, this might be a, a $10 thing over here, but 10 times 100, that's yeah, you know, that's $1,000. Take action, uh, take a chance, and just learn how to do things. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it everything adds up. And you you should be able to support your family off of two or three acres mm -hmm. pretty easily uh, if you do everything correctly. I mean, and, and even if we're saying correctly, we're not saying our way is the best way. We're saying correctly as far as like, even if you have like a 25% margin of error and you screw up, 
learn from your screw ups and feed your screw ups to something else. You should, you you should be okay. It takes uh, it used with old timey farming techniques back in the day. It used to take an acre of land to support one human, but with modern farming techniques and drip irrigation and crop rotation, everything else we have going on, mm -hmm. uh, you vertical should, growth. Yeah, vertical growing, and then all these other fun things, hydroponics, aquaponics. All the other stuff, you combine it all and synergistically it goes together. That you should be able to very easily support a family of four or a family of five off of two acres without really even making it look beyond the setup. The setup's a pain in the butt. But beyond the setup, it should look like work. Yeah. I mean, it'll look like I mean, child slave labor. But uh, <laughs> that's okay. That's why you have them, right? Yeah, uh, even if you wanted to grow little gardens at your home, you know, focus on like the hearty stuff like potatoes and, and things that are really going to feed your family of five. Um, you know, I heard a heartbreaking story today about this woman um, who she's, you know, she literally cannot afford to to eat like she the groceries are ridiculous. You know, she's living on a fixed income. She's getting food stamps because she's a stay at home mom. But that doesn't exist anymore. Like there's no such thing as a stay at home mom anymore because Inflation. We have to, yeah, inflation. We have to. You literally can't. A hundred thousand dollar a year job now is about like a thirty five or forty thousand dollar a year job twenty years ago. Yeah, it is. I feel like our par our parents had the American dream where they had that middle class that felt. Like there's no more were, middle class. Yeah, there's no more of that that doesn't exist anymore. So no, and, and really not, concerning. So the only way you're going to be able to do that is to opt out of the damn system. Yeah, and live your own life, your own system, and be a little bit federal. Yeah. And that is the only way you're going to be able to make that dream happen for you and your family is uh, to be able to just say, you know what, that was great. I'm going to go ahead and not participate and do shit my way. Yeah, grow your potatoes, make your own bread, you know, make your own spaghetti sauces, you know, um, grow corn, you know, things like that, right, for your small family. Um, get have involved with communities. Too. Have fun, too. And, I mean, it's a great experience. You know, we have... I have a lot. I have a blast when I do DIYs. I'm getting. I'm really getting good at them, and I'm. I look forward to like our home projects and what we're gonna do. And right now, we're in the process of literally like drawing out our own plans for what we want our house to look like and and what we want our own like. You know, that's gonna be like our oasis. So we're planning everything, and you y'all are coming along for the ride. Yeah, you're gonna have coming along for the ride, but nothing gets done without a plan. So you can't shoot darts in the dark. Yes, you can. You got it. No, that is terrifying. <laughs> You'll overspend and you won't accomplish it. So don't do that. Um, have a plan for that's a plan like for a plan. Seventy-five percent of our construction processes start off with that's a great your, plan. That is your great plan. Okay, I'm more realistic, and then they I'm just the goes to shit. No. When the first slightly unlevel I'm, thing comes up, I'm the and you need to reason. get the no, summit engineer and all. No, sir. <laughs> I'm the voice of reason. I'm like, hey, let's buy. If, if we're not familiar with the build, let's buy a blueprint. You know, a couple of bucks. So it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to break the that. bank. Four or five beers. Yeah, out. this Expert. is what I have to deal I, with. No, I it's not going to look. No, we're not going to. We're this. not going to. No. <laughs> if, we're if, not if I'm things. sitting there a little crooked in the chair, no. the deck looks straight. No, <laughs> that's not how it's going to happen. So I will hire a professional before I let my deck look worked. <laughs> anyway, uh, we do really good stuff. But uh, buy blueprints, you know. I'm if, good at blueprints. And get, uh, build the materials and then hit it. Like Try like to get it done. Things. So it's, it's going to be really fun. From our family to yours, thank you for listening. Thank you for bearing with us. Thank you for waiting and coming back to listen. After we took our little bit of hiatus there, um, we love our listeners. We really hope the best for you. And we hope that through our communication with you, we can help make your life better. Uh, even if times get bad or if yeah. they don't, it doesn't matter. Our hearts are, out, are going out to the people in Lahaina, Hawaii. Um, you know, we're, we're with you. We hear you. We're listening. We're watching. And, you know, you guys that are helping the people out, um, continue doing God's good work, man. Like that's, that's just amazing that you're there. And if there's anything that we could do, email us, you know, we'll create awareness. We'll be your sounding board, whatever we can do. Yeah. Let us know guys. And, uh, we love you guys. Love you guys. Good night. Good night.